সবাইকে স্বাগতম অস্ত্র আর্কাইভের তরফ থেকে আমি শাহাকান্ত আপনাদের সবাইকে অভিনন্দন জানাচ্ছি আজকের এই সন্ধ্যে আয়োজনের সন্ধ্যাবেলার আয়োজন বলা যেতে পারে আমরা প্রতিদিন সপ্তাহে একদিন সন্ধ্যাবেলা আলাপ আলোচনা করছি বেশ কিছুদিন হলো করোনার পরবর্তীকালে আমাদের এখানে যারা উপস্থিত আছেন দেখতে পাচ্ছি তাদের বেশিরভাগই আমাদের সঙ্গে বিভিন্ন ভাবে সম্পর্কযুক্ত খুব বিস্তারিত ভাবে কিছু বলবো না আজকে যেটা খুব বলার আছে সেটা হচ্ছে যে অস্ট্রার্কাইভ মাসে আমাদের দেশভাগ সাতচল্লিশের যে বিশাল একটি ঘটনা ঘটে দেশভাগ সেটিকে কেন্দ্র করে কিছু আলোচনার সূত্রপাত করা যায় কিনা এরকমটি ভেবেছিল এবং আমাদের আগ্রহ ছিল বাংলাদেশে আমাদের সাতচল্লিশের দেশভাগ নিয়ে আলোচনা কিছুটা কম শোনা যায় কম হয় কম্পারেটিভলি পশ্চিমবাংলায় কিংবা দিল্লিতে পাঞ্জাবে এটা অনেক বেশি শোনা যায় আমরা চেষ্টা করছিলাম যে এই অংশটিকে আমরা যদি নিয়ে কিছু আলোচনা করে দেখি আমাদের ইতিহাসের দিকে একটু ফিরে তাকানো যায় তাহলে কেমন হয় সেটার প্রথম অংশে প্রথম পর্বে আমাদের সাথে যুক্ত হয়েছিলেন কলকাতা থেকে অধ্যাপক মানস রায় তিনি আমাদেরকে শুনেছেন তার স্মৃতি একটি উদ্বাস্তু কলোনিতে বেড়ে ওঠার গল্প এবং স্মৃতি বিষয়ক রাজনীতি এবং বাণিজ্য এবং ইত্যাদি ইত্যাদি বিষয়ক একটি সুন্দর একটি অসামান্য বক্তৃতা সেটি আমরা শুনেছি এবং সেটি হয়তো আমরা কিছুদিনের মধ্যে ইউটিউবে আপ করে দেব দ্বিতীয় দিন আমার সঙ্গে আমাদের সঙ্গে যুক্ত হয়েছিলেন করাচি থেকে মাসুদ আলম খান যিনি একজন শিল্পী এবং খুব ইন্টারেস্টিংলি যার সঙ্গে এই উপমহাদেশের প্রায় পুরো উপমহাদেশ চারই একটি সম্পর্ক আছে মানে যার জন্ম কুষ্টিয়ায় যিনি বড় যিনি আবার কিছুটা সময় কাটিয়েছেন আহ চিটগাঙে একাত্তরের পর যুদ্ধবন্দী হিসাবে তিনি চলে গেছেন কলকাতা হয়ে এলাহাবাদে সেখানে একটি যুদ্ধবন্দীদের শিবিরে তাকে থাকতে হয়েছে আড়াই বছর সেখান থেকে উনি চলে গেছেন করাচিতে তিনি তার জীবনের গল্প আমাদের শুনেছেন আজকে আমাদের আয়োজনের তৃতীয় পর্ব আমরা এখানে আরেকটু অন্য ধরনের কথা শুনতে বলে আমি আশা করছি আজকে এবং আমরা খুব আনন্দিত যে আমাদের সঙ্গে আজকে দুজন বন্ধুই বলবো বন্ধু যুক্ত হয়েছে আমাদের সঙ্গে যারা দুজনই ঘটনাচক্রে এখন ইউকেতে বসবাস করেন দুজনই বাংলাদেশ অরিজিন বাংলাদেশ বাংলায় যেটাকে বলে বাংলা বাংলাদেশি বংশোদ্ভূত সামিয়া খাতুন এখন সোয়াসে কাজ করছেন এবং লাইলি উদ্দিন উনি এখন কিংস কলেজের গবেষণা কাজ করছেন দুজনই গবেষক ঠিক ব্যক্তিগত অভিজ্ঞতা আমি জানি না ওনারা কতটা বলবেন বা ওনারা কিভাবে শেয়ার করবেন কিন্তু আমি যদি নিশ্চিত যে তারা এমন কিছু তথ্য আমাদের সামনে হাজির করবেন এমন কিছু বক্তব্য আমাদেরকে বলবেন সেটা হচ্ছে আমাদের নতুন করে দেশভাগ এবং দেশভাগের আশেপাশের বিষয়গুলোকে বুঝতে হয়তো সাহায্য করবে তো নিশ্চিত ভাবে আজকের মূল বক্তা দুজন তাদের কথাই আমাদের শুনতে হবে এবং তাদের কথা শোনার জন্যই আমরা আজকে উপস্থিত হয়েছি এবং তার আগে আমি ছোট করে আমাদের বন্ধু শেজাদকে বলবো ছোট করে যদি আমাদের এই দুই বক্তা সম্পর্কে কিছু কথা বলে শেজাদ ধন্যবাদ শাহুল ভাই আমি আসলে জাস্ট এখানে এক ধরনের যোগাযোগ কর্তা হিসেবে কাজ করছি সামিয়া বন্ধু মানুষ সামিয়া একজন ঐতিহাসিক এবং লাইলি উদ্দিন উনি একজন ঐতিহাসিক সামিয়া হচ্ছে আমার প্রথম বন্ধু যিনি ঐতিহাসিক হিসাবে নিজেকে পরিচয় দেন আমার কাছে তো সামিয়া লাইলি দুজনেই যেটা শেয়ার করেছেন তাদের পরিচয় আমি সেটা সংক্ষেপে বলছি এবং সামিয়া লাইলি আপনাদেরকে তাদের নিজস্ব পরিচয় নিজে উপস্থাপন করবে Uh, Samia Khatun is a feminist historian who researches the life worlds of people colonized by the British Empire. She's currently the chair of the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS London. Our Laili Uddin, Samia Madhu Me Jashat Amman Puri Chaya, Ari Jun Uti Hashik. Laili Uddin is a historian working on class, religion, and social movements in post-colonial South Asia. She is currently a research fellow at King's College London. What do you want to say about Samia? I want to say about Samia, I want to say about Samia, I want to say about Samia. Okay, thank you, Dhanabad. Um, thank you for having me, uh, inviting me to your group to talk. I mean, I'm going to talk about English, I'm going to talk about English, I'm going to talk about 
চেষ্টা করব যে যদি আমি যা বলছি সেটা বুঝতে পারছেন না একটু কেউ যদি একটু জানান হাত দেখে যদি জানান আমি একটু একটু আসতে অথবা অন্য ভাষায় চেষ্টা করতে পারি আমার নিজেকে নিয়ে একটু প্রথমে বলতে চাই আই বাংলাদেশি বাই স্পিরিট অ্যান্ড বার্থ আই এম অস্ট্রেলিয়ান বাই সিটিজেনশিপ অ্যান্ড আই এম এ হিস্টোরিয়ান বাই ট্রেনিং দুই বছর ধরে ঢাকায় আমি বাস করছিলাম টু থাউজেন্ড থেকে শুরু করে ইউ ল্যাবে আমি হিস্ট্রি পড়াচ্ছিলাম আমার আশা ছিল যে ওইখানে একটা হিস্ট্রি প্রোগ্রাম তৈরি করে তুলতে মানে বাংলাদেশের প্রাইভেট ইউনিভার্সিটি সিনে একটা হিস্ট্রি ডিপার্টমেন্ট খুলতে চেষ্টা করছিলাম এই কাজ শেষ হওয়ার আগে এই সোয়াজের কাজটা পেয়ে আমি এই গত বছর চলে এসেছি কিন্তু মাই হার্ট বেসিকলি রোমাইন্স ইন বাংলাদেশ অ্যান্ড ইট আই আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্য টাস্ক অফ হিস্ট্রি টু বি অ্যাবসলিউটলি ক্রুশিয়াল for us understanding not just understanding partition but getting beyond some of the violence of colonial legacies um, in our psyches as south asians so today i'm going to be speaking about the idea of partition rather than partition as a concrete political event or series of events in the 20th century um my accents also quite strong it's a strong australian accent so again as i said i'll try and go slow and mix up uh, bangla and english so that um you know as many people as possible do understand what on earth i'm saying so i want to talk about partition or deshpag today as an architecture of thought that shapes how we see any bit of south asia its past present and its future now we are usually used to thinking of partition or deshpag as a geographical ordering it's we think of it usually as a mapping of religious communities to nations um what i want to suggest today is that actually partition is very much also a temporal ordering by temporal i mean about time partition i want to say is actually all about time now apnara to ekhane chat box e likhte paren likhe um mane interact korar to possibility ache tai na ami ekta proshno korte chai apnader ke ei audience e ami joto tok bujhte perechi apnara artist apnara lekhok um dekhlam azizul rasel ache uni to history porai yulabe তো আপনাদের মধ্যে কারা নিজেদেরকে মানে হ্যাঁ মেনি অফ ইউ উড ডিসক্রাইব ইউর সেলফ অ্যাজ প্রোগ্রেসিভস চ্যাট বক্সে একটু একটু ইনশারা দেন যে আই উড ইউ নো আই উড আই উড ডিসক্রাইব মাই সেলফ অ্যাজ প্রোগ্রেসিভ ইজ এনি ওয়ান ইন দিস অডিয়েন্স উইলিং টু ডিসক্রাইব দেম সেলফ অ্যাজ প্রোগ্রেসিভ কেউ না this. <laughs> হ্যাঁ একটা ছোট প্রশ্ন আসছে হোয়াট ডু ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড বাই প্রোগ্রেসিভ কোটা begin beginning people thinking about precisely that question what do we understand by progressive what i want to talk about today is the idea of time that is embedded in the idea of progress and how partition is actually central to the very idea of progress 
Now, where does this idea of progress come from? We know that it's an idea that arrives with British colonialism, of course. So before we even get to South Asia or Bengal in particular, let's look at what they're thinking about in Europe, just as the East India Company is actually beginning its formal rule in Bengal in the 1750s. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will get to see my PowerPoint. You can all see it? Yeah? Good, okay. So before, at the time that the East India Company is beginning its consolidation of power in Bengal, the story of progress is actually also being birthed in Europe. And usually the story of progress in, from the European perspective is not specifically about South Asia, it's about humanity, it's about civilization as a whole. The story goes that you know, we as humanity are marching from the East to the West on a pathway of greater civilization. Now, this is a deeply, deeply racist formulation and a deeply racialized story when viewed from Europe. And the way that the story is told is that there's a torch of civilization. Whoever it passes to has, you know, civilization and the greatest amount of knowledge at that point in time. So this is, we're talking the 1750s, 60s, 70s, 80s. This is when this idea is emerging. So there's this idea that civilization begins in Africa, right? And there's a torch of civilization that then passes on from African and indigenous peoples to South Asia and the Middle East. And then from there, it passes on to white civilization, which is the most advanced, supposedly the most advanced form of civilization. So this tale of progress of the movement of the torch of civilization lays the foundation for this racial hierarchy of who comes before who. Now, Akon, a Porjunto, London and Motonaka Tagai, a idea that hierarchy at it. African or indigenous Adibashi Manusha, Tarpore Hutse, South Asian and Middle Eastern Manusha, Tarpore Hutse Shadara. This is the racial hierarchy that is actually established through this progress narrative that is born at roughly at the same time as formal rule of uh, South Asia uh, from Britain. So let's take a look at what happens when this story gets to South Asia. Now, this story of progress is first and most, uh, not first, but most powerfully um, becomes the lens through which Bengal and South Asia is seen, actually through history books, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest, okay? Because it's um, very much in the history books that uh, colonial rulers are writing and training their officers to read and understand how South Asia works, that they actually first start seeing South Asia through the lens of progress. Now, what you've got on the screen there is a book uh, called The History of British India by James Mill. Some of you would be very familiar with it. It's written first in 1817. And this is the book that in many ways um, consolidates a particular progress narrative for South Asia. So let's just have a very quick look at where partition comes into this. You get to see what's happening in this book if you just look at the table of contents, okay? So book one, where I've got uh, the first red line, you, there go, the first book is going to tell us about the establishment of British rule in, you know, the beginning of the East India Company from the 1600s. Book two is going to be about the Hindus, okay? Book two is going to continue, continue, and then book three is going to be about the quote-unquote Mohammedans, the Muslims. And then book four is then going to come back to the East India Company and the sort of establishment of rule from 1757 and so on, okay? So what you're going to see in James Mill's uh, many volume history is the partition of the different communities into slots of time. He's going to tell generation after generation of thinkers that this is actually what South Asian history looks like. There's going to be, in this uh, James Mill's notion of history, there's going to be a 
an ancient golden period of Hindu rule, which is apparently quite glorious, followed by invasion by Muslim foreigners and a decline of the glory of South Asia under Muslim rule. And then there's going to be British arrival to South Asia and the beginning of civilization and enlightened civilization. So you actually, what you get to see from this moment on after James Mill is that almost every single English language history book that is being written about South Asia is going to partition the past into three like this. It's going to be Hindu, Muslim, British. So you start to see here what I mean about partition, the idea of partition being very much a temporal idea. It's an idea that is actually very much about time. Now, the implications of this story are, yeah. of course, absolutely huge. You know, they're, they're, it's sort of the idea of partition from the very founding of the early institutions of the East India Company the legal system is going to believe this story. The courts of all sorts are going to believe this story. The taxation system is going to believe this story. So communities are then partitioned off piece by piece as Muslims or Hindus. People are continuously asking, Who's, is this person a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist or Christian? That's a question that is actually first asked in that form with the British and this particular story that is about the partition of communities. Now, of course, it's not, uh, this story is first intended to train British colonial rulers who are going to come to South Asia to be uh, the colonial elite, but it doesn't take long until the South Asian elite also start believing this particular story about the past. Now, after independence of India and Pakistan from Britain in 1947, and then after the independence of Bangladesh in 1971, this imperial template that you see here becomes the underpinnings of the national story, the national stories that emerge right throughout South Asia. Now, what's very interesting how this how it goes from being an imperial story to a national story. So in India, it's uh, in the nation space of India, you know, very much the, this ancient golden period is what we're trying to go back to is the kind of narrative that the Modi government, for instance, will try and peddle. So if you think about a couple of years ago when the name of Allahabad was changed to, um, you know, changed to, uh, what was it, Praya Rag, Praya Rag or something like that, it was, it was going back to an ancient period of golden rule. So this is the, the Indian nationalist, um, current Indian nationalist narrative is very much about trying to get back to that golden period. In Pakistan, this um, this three part division stays three part division. They just switch the story. There's a terrible period of Hindu rule, and then there's a glorious period of Muslim uh, um, sort of civilization that is eclipsed by the British. And we must we must go back to this Muslim period of glory. And the importance is to actually take the Hindu, make sure that the Hindu bits have been fully sort of eclipsed in, in the process of becoming a nation. So it's very interesting that the, in some ways, the structure of the story stays the same in India and Pakistan, they're just flipped. And of course, in Bangladesh, it's much more complex because both sets of stories are actually very much in play at different times and in different political arguments. And you, you basically get a much more complicated, fragmented story in the tale of Bangladesh. And, and there's competing visions for, you know, which, which bit is bad, which bit is good, and what does enlightenment and civilization actually look like. Now, what I want to say is that all three of these uh, national tales of what independence means and what partition means um, have the one thing in common. They, they all disagree on what progress looks like, right? 
Unnoyon. What does it actually look like in terms of where, we're, where we've come from and where we're going? The one thing they agree on is that it's progress. It, it is still, it is still Unnoyon, it is still progress along which we must march to get to civilization. So here I'm talking about the state narrative. I'm not talking about ordinary people. I mean, this is the elite state narrative of where the country is going. Okay. So um, what my question is, is, you know, we, I've, I've talked, I've sort of mentioned how this is a tale that very much comes from history books that are English language history books about divide and conquer, et cetera, et cetera. What other stories are there about how we could be moving from yesterday to today to tomorrow? And what about all the other history books? James Mill is not the only person to write a history of South Asia. There are many historians of South Asia writing about South Asia concurrent to James Mill. Is there another story apart from progress that is actually structuring um, how they are writing? If the problem came from a history book, perhaps the solution is in another, in another type of history book is um, what I'm trying to say. And of course, right throughout South Asia, there are history books written in many, many, many South Asian languages. And of course, there are history books that are not written that are oral um, and Mukhe Mukhe Charano Golpo, Mukhe Mukhe Charano Itihash. There are many different forms of historical consciousness that do not um, do partition, that do not do this idea of partition in every single piece of uh, storytelling that, that uh, they are doing. So what was written in these and can we use them? Are they still alive or has this story of progress just partitioned us forever? These are you know, important questions as we might try and think about decolonizing how we think about time, decolonizing how we think about history, the past, partition, etc. Now, the what I was very lucky in is during my PhD research, I happened to come across one such history book that did give you another story apart from progress and partition. So I just want to briefly talk about that to give you a sense of the kinds of stories that are um, aren't doing partition are egg egg look into aknara already janin i mean akon ja bolte jabo she will aknara already janin bhetor theke janin so but let me just briefly tell you about the book that i'm going to talk about the poetry that i'm going to talk about there's a picture of it on the screen just there basically uh in australia which is where i grew up there are these tiny little mosques in which you can find lots of things that people have left behind them and they were built in the 1860s. So about 10 years ago now I went to one of these mosques in a little town called Broken Hill and um, there was this book that was there and in English someone had written on it the Holy Quran. And I thought if I read this Quran, I'll be able to work out how, who built this mosque and, you know, maybe they, they, it will give some information about who, who these early Muslims were. So I opened up the book and it wasn't a Quran at all. It was actually a 500 page book of poetry in Bangla. So this is in the middle of the Australian desert. Now, it's a book that was, it's a putti, and it's a book that was uh, printed first in 1860. And I'm not going to go into the story of why on earth that book ended up in Australia, because that's a whole other story. What I want to concentrate on for the remaining time here is, this book is actually a history book. It's a Kasa Salambia, or Stories of the Prophets. And you can actually read it as a history book, a book that is telling you the history of the prophets of Islam. And if you read it as a history book, you start to see a very other, very different um, story about time that is quite separate to progress, okay? Now, I just want to, the, I want to show you the seal that was on the uh, top of the book. 
It's, it's uh, published by Kazi Shofiuddin. And as you can see, it's got Shun um, 1282 Shal Srabun. So you start to see from the very beginning of the book that it's actually moving in three different times at once. It's moving in the common era calendar because it refers to British time all throughout the book. Okay, So it's moving in, you know, today it's 2020 on the British calendar or what was once the British calendar. Now it's called the common era calendar. This book is using the Muslim calendar, it's using the Bangla calendar, and it's using the British calendar, at all three of them at the same time. So you immediately get a sense, oh wow, there's three different types of time happening in this book. So if you then go into the actual poetry, so what I want to do is just read you a very small section from the poetry and then tell you uh, what I think is going on in uh, the poetry. Okay. So, because it's the Pisasalambia stories of the prophets or histories of the prophets. It is how Allah created the world. It starts with that story. Okay, so I'm going to read you an excerpt from where the trees are being made. Okay. Mane Uni Kobita Kobi Rezaudin, Munshi Rezaullah, sorry. Um, he describes the creation of the seas, etc., etc., and then he gets onto the forests. Okay. Choto choto dana hoite, bora bora gat tate, poida kore esa je sultan. Apna kudrut kore, bos tike jungle kore, shumut dure banai moidan. Kurite tarif are, shadho ato achekar, joto kichu tahar kudrote. Ak mushti kak tia, mati murut kia. Poida keulo adom chutte. Tahar aulad joto, nahi hai ak moto, rub rong nahi hai meal. Deho ar dunoyon, hat pao nak kan, juda juda rong ar deal. Kehu kala kehu gora, kehu ba chander para, kehu ba jesmal boron. And so on. Okay, so it's just very briefly describing the creation of Adam. Now, what happens if you look a little bit closer at how it's describing the creation of Adam? It's very interesting. Okay, so there's a um, fistful of dust. Um, there's a there's an image in there where the children of Adam are actually the different parts of a human body. So if you see here, hat pao nakan juda juda rong art deal. Kehu kala kehu gora kehu ba chander para kehu ba jesumal boron. So ita firstly it's a very old, very different type of Bangla with lots of Farsi, lots of Urdu, lots of um, uh, Hindi words in it, and it's poetry. It's poetry that you read out to a group of people, but. Each and every one of these descriptions of the prophets, if you take a closer look, there's something very interesting going on here. If you just look slightly beneath the surface of this story about Adam, you actually also see the story of Purusha. So Purusha is a character that usually is thought to belong to Hindu mythology and is um, you know, this cosmic man that is thrown from the heavens and from his feet are made a certain type of people, from his hands are made a certain type of people, from his eyes are made a certain type of people. And there's a story about Purusha in the Rig Veda and often the story of Purusha is actually cited as the origin story of caste in um, sort of Hindu hierarchies of thought. So what you actually get to see here is it's, it's both 
It's both stories at once. So what happens throughout this book is each and every one of the stories of the prophets is actually a story simultaneously of a Muslim prophet and of a figure that belongs to another cosmological system. So you get Shiva, you get, you get Adam, you get Shiva, you get Brahma, you get all these different characters that you can actually see in a single um, figure. Now, what does that mean? This is just very, very, very ordinary in Bengal to have these kinds of quota, what's sometimes being called syncretic stories. But if you start reading this book as a history book, what happens is you see that while the story of progress partitioned off Hindu, Muslim, British as three stages of time, what this kind of storytelling is doing is saying, no, they coexist layered upon each other. And actually you can see whatever it is that you want to see. If you want to read this story and see Adam, you will. If you want to read this story and see Purusha, you will. You will see what it is that you're looking for. So in the end, what you end up getting is a book, a history book, that's actually telling you, you can learn to see, you can learn to see past, present, future along a number of different lines of vision. It's a very, very, very different story to progress. And it's, it's a story that um, has sort of existed in South Asia in various forms for a very, very, very long time. Now, what I want to sort of end with um, is the, as I see it as a professional historian, the discipline of history as imported or exported from Britain has played this incredible role in actually inventing the idea of partition and actually it becoming an almost second nature of how we see the past and how we understand past, present, and future. So I believe that the history profession today actually has the responsibility and also the possibility of re rewiring precisely how it is we understand the past. If partition is something that is fundamentally and in an early way done through history books, it is also in history books that it can be undone. Now, the story I've shared with you today, in some ways, the James Mill story is of the colonial administrators and the South Asian elite. This Puthi I've shared with you, it's a little bit more ambiguous as to who was reading these. It, as it turns out, um, one of the most joyous things about this research journey has been that it turns out that my own great grandfather was reading this particular putti, this Kasasa Lampia. And, and, you know, one of the most delightful discoveries recently also is that Lily's um, ancestor, Lily's grandfather, was also a putti reader. And they were quite differently positioned. I'm going to say they had very, very, very different class positions. The fact that they're both putti readers suggests to us that this putti literature and this form of history, historical storytelling, actually, it's, I wonder whether it is a cross class divides. So I will leave there and um, I've given you an early history of the idea of partition. And hopefully we will now get to hear from Lily about its realization into political reality in the 20th century. Lily, Lily, it's your turn. <laughs> You're on mute. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Samia. Um, our, I mean, to chat about Bangla, but our journey. I mean, actually, that journey, London, I mean, our journey was in London. Our Baba Ma Sinet, take it. Una, una, our gram, take it. So, na der, um, our Basha, I mean, Sineti, um, Sineti, kotha hoy. So. Ashra archived um, 
এই নিমন্ত্রণের জন্য অনেক অনেক ধন্যবাদ তো আমি শুরু করি আমি একজন ওয়ার্কিং ক্লাস হিস্টোরিয়ান আই এম ওয়ার্কিং ক্লাস ব্রিটিশ বাংলাদেশি হিস্টোরিয়ান হু কেম ইন টু মাই ওয়ার্ক I've been doing for the last 10 years I've been working on a project that thinks about the making and unmaking of Pakistan through the mobilization of peasants Krishok Mazdoor um through the mobilization of peasants and workers under the leadership of Maulana Bashani um so I mean I've been doing this for the last 10 years so I might sound a bit tired but hopefully I won't try I'll try not to let it show too much um and this is a new paper in some sense so let me just try to share my screen first uh sorry Can you see the yes. screen? Okay, yeah. great. Okay, this is great. For the Deshbagh of 1947, in the case of East Bengal, has been understood, at least in scholarly writings and popular writings as well, and imaginations, as the end of something, as not rather than the end of something, as the continuation of a struggle, right? The struggle as the continuation of a struggle for liberation. except this time it was for this um for bengali or national liberation the language movement of 1952 but obviously started much earlier was seen as the watershed moment was the was the event that marked the first stirrings of bengali nationalism against an autocratic pakistan and 1971 ekatter juddo and the formation of bangladesh as the conclusion of that struggle and my work is going to suggest something i'm going to suggest something different the period of decolonization generated different and multiple projects imaginaries and futures now the project of national liberation was in some ways a very conservative and unimaginative one it's a copy of something that already existed elsewhere but my work on the poor and landless rural peasants and lower class worker mobilization under the leadership of Maulana Bashani the peer the mazdoor shramik neta the rajniti bid shows how this constituency and their activities and practices offered an alternative radical and progressive project now what do i mean by that what is the when i'm saying alternative radical progressive politics i mean something that imagined a radical citizenship or a sort of a radical way of being with the state something that imagined the dismantling and of oppressive structures and institutions and when i say oppressive structures and institutions i mean the things like the police the courts border guards and that limited people's freedom and also a politics that imagined solidarities that crossed physical social pol political and cultural borders now this was a politics of liberation that was cut short we never saw it happen it was cut short and quite brutally by those who didn't really understand what it meant to work for a new world and when i say work i mean work physically emotionally or imaginatively in fact they feared the new world yet these futures if we recover them remain to us as both a legacy a durable legacy and a potential for something that can act, for something that can still be done so in the talk what i will do today is i will show briefly how some of these radical imaginaries and futures showed themselves in the early years of independence in the shape of peasant and workers struggles and how the state of pakistan responded to it so on the 12th of august 1947 a relieved mount patton penned a quick note to sir frederick chamas born and thanked him for agreeing to jinnah's last minute request to become the first governor of east bengal in independent pakistan on 15th of pakistan sorry 15th of august 1947 in a ceremony strikingly reminiscent 
striking reminiscent of the day or two old colonial past, Bourne mounted the day in Curzon Hall and was sworn, sworn in. Now his oath of allegiance was sure to have sounded peculiar to some uh, ears, if not even unbefitting for the occasion. He said, I, Frederick Chalmers Bourne, do you solemnly um, affirm that in the office of the governor of East Bengal, I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his majesty, King George VI, his heirs and successors and to the constitution of Pakistan as by law established. And that I will do to right, and I, that I will do right to all manners of people after the laws and usages um, of Pakistan without fear or favor, affection or ill will. Now, after administering, um, so he goes on to take this oath and then he administers the oath to Khwaja Nazimuddin, who becomes the new prime minister of East Bengal and his cabinet. And then Bourne unfurls the flag of the future, the green and white crescent moon and star flag of the post-colonial and independent state of Pakistan. The flag is hoisted and the guard of honors are inspected. Bourne retires for the day. In many ways, it appeared that not much had changed. There was still a governor of general that was pledging his obeisance to, not to Pakistan, but to actually first and foremost to the majesty King George. So it appeared nothing had changed, right? But actually everything had changed. In contrast to the sober and restrained proceedings inside Curzon Hall, Ahmed Kamal, um, historian of Bangladesh in his powerful book, State Against Nation, um, colorfully describes how the new world was being celebrated with much abandon and merriment in Dhaka and other places of East Pakistan. Um, so he, said, he talks about how people poured into the cities, train fares went unpaid, seats and podiums were jam-packed, firecrackers and ham, hand bombs were set off, hotels, mosques and open parks overflowed and prisoners clamored to be let out. Now the differences in these celebrations between what um, Frederick Chalmers Bourne was doing and how the people were celebrating are what Dipesh Chakraborty says as the clumsy, complicated, and inherently incomplete nature of the post-colonial process. And what he means by that is that creative inability of the post-colonial state to fully make that transition between memory and expectations, or in other words, to move from the past into the future. And it is this, um, and it is this that emerged, their inability to move from the past into the future that emerged as a major source of tension between the people and the state in those early years of Pakistan. Maulana Bashani's remark at the religious occasion of an isal -e sawab a festival that offers um, prayers for the dead in Siraj Ganj on the 24th of January, 1954, perfectly captured the dilemma when asked by the superintendent of police that he could not, when told by the superintendent of the police that he could not discuss p politics, he responded, so am I a tenant or a riot of the police? I am a free citizen of, Pakistan, of free Pakistan. But despite his assertions, Bashani was alluding to the persistence of old feelings, memories, habits and practices and structures and relationships of unfreedom. Right? When he refers to, am I a tenant or riot of police? He's referring to these old feelings and habits and practices of unfreedom that were spoiling the experience of the free state. And it was precisely this colonial hangover that generated amongst the people a perception of the present as an anomaly. The present was an anomaly and that the land of the future, Pakistan, was yet to be made, had not yet been made. So the prevailing sentiment of that period then, which appeared on pamphlets, handbills, and newspaper columns on the lips of the public was, Amra ki chila, ebon ki what, what had we wanted and what we got? But this moment, but this sort of expression was, but this was not just an expression of disappointment, but also an understanding that work remained Mohammed Twaha, the Communist Party member, um, described it as ekta kichu korte hobe, that work was still to be done to bring about that future. 
So what was that Pakistan, that, that sort of that project of Muslim futures that had yet to be realized? So let me give you an idea of what that project of Muslim futures was. So before partition and during the interwar years of 1940s, Abdul Wahid, so what you're seeing on the screen is a, a book, a little pamphlet of songbooks composed by Abdul Wahid, a Sileti Hakim and pro poet who composed and published this songbook um, for the Muslim League for the purpose of mobilizing Muslim ma masses. So one of the rallying songs was on the Durbikko, on famine. Each verse here is a roll call of the soaring prices of food items and other essential commodities that were experienced over this period. It listed the price of ghee, chickpeas, lentil, honey, cows, buffalo, flour, and wheat. All these items that were yearned for, that were yearned for and denied to them during this period. He says, goats, duck, and chicken were going out to the world. On loaded military trucks they went. Oh my, I hear that a hali of eggs cost 12 anna. And the price of ch salt and chilies um, and tobacco is three takas. Onion garlic is on fire and the price of ginger is one taka. An item of, um, so basically he said the only thing that's cheap is water. This is the only thing that we can survive on. Now it was this song of a starved Bengal that Jana Mukherjee Basically, this was a song of a starved Bengal in the 1940s. Janam Mukherjee, in his powerful book, Hungry Bengal, argued that the wartime famine, which was a decade in the making, so it didn't just happen in 43, it was a decade in the making, left deep lacerating wounds on the socio-political landscape of Bengal, and it cleaved society across communal lines. The Calcutta riots of 1946 was a symptom of it. So what was Pakistan? Pakistan was to be the antithesis of all the horrors that had passed. It was meant to be a sated and happy Bengal. Talim Hussein, a poet, envisioned it as a place of mirth, merriment, and non-stop feasting on food. He described it as a land of Chirostai Eid, a permanent Eid, eternal Eid, a reward for the people of East Bengal after the long and hard sacrifice of their bodies. However, when Pakistan finally came, it was a rude awakening. Because when Pakistan comes, the specter of famine had lingered on. From its very inception, East Pakistan found itself in the grip of an acute food crisis, which official documents liken to a near famine. So you, every time, from all the documents that you see from the 1940s up to 71 itself, and even beyond, you see the officials talking about a a near famine all the time. Now, the government go downs stood more or less empty during these early days of independence. There were no wheat stocks for the migrants who were coming in. And by September 1947, the government stocks contained less than two weeks requirements of ration goods for towns. The crisis continued despite its fluctuations. You know, it goes up and down, but the food crisis was nonetheless a constant feature in people's lives. Of, East, in, of constant feature in their lives in the early years and beyond. So the, how did the population of East Bengal respond to this food crisis? With growing anger, res resentment and resistance towards East Pakistan government. Now, where did the most intense resistance come from? Now, they came from the rural countryside and especially from those whose claims to the land and the produce grown on it um, was the weakest. So these were namely the landless peasants and sharecroppers, um, like the Nankar tenants of Silet and the Hajong tribes of Maimun Singh, whose struggles against the oppressive land tenure arrangements, um, which deprived them of a substantial portion of their produce, or in the case of the Nankar peasants who had to do extra work uh, for the landlord, predated partition. So they were already in some ways bonded to the land and to the labor of the land. So the, things got harder for them. At the height of the food crisis in July 1949, over 700 Hajongs attacked a police camp partitioned, um, sorry, police camp stationed in Ranipur of Maimunsi. The anger was not just directed at the shortage of food and price rises, but the familiarity of the struggle, especially for those who were to bear most of its burden. 
Bashani in a pamphlet captured the frustrations of these East Bengali protesters. He said, for those tired and starving women and men, freedom had no meaning. In other words, if everything was exactly the same as it was before, had, pa had Pakistan actually come to be? Now, the government's convinced that the violent resistance of poor and landless peasants and sharecroppers, such as the Nankars and the Hajongs, convinced themselves that these were communists, that they were communists or they were Indian instigated, if not both, and they declared them to be hostile to Pakistan. So he declared that any resistance that came from these groups as anti-national, something that we continue to hear this very day. In October 1949, the Home Department issued a proclamation declaring parts of North Maimunshing as home to the Hajongs and other poor peasant communities as a disturbed area, which meant the allocation of additional policemen whose costs were to be covered by the inhabitants there. However, the explanation that these were anti-Pakistani, that these struggles were anti-Pakistan in character and content do not sit comfortably upon closer scrutiny. Now, why do I say this? If we examine Ajoy Bhatt um, Bhattacharya's work on the Nankar tenants, he, so Ajoy Bhatt Bhattacharya works on the Nankar tenants, and he talks about this incident, which is of a police firing in Sanishwar, a Nankar village in Silet, on all, 18th of August, 1949. And he talks about especially the conversation between the police and the people of Sanishwar and the other neighboring villages. And we see an alternative explanation that's offered for the resistance. The police asked the villagers, do you want Pakistan? And at once they shouted, we want, we want. The police once again said, then raise your voice and say Pakistan Zindabad. The large, the large crowd of villagers shouted at once, Goribed Pakistan Zindabad. So as soon as they said, long live the poor person's Pakistan, at that point, according to Ajoy, that the police declared the gathering illegal and fired upon the villagers, resulting in several dead and many injured. So two, what we see from this account is that two different and competing conceptions of Pakistan emerge. One in which it exists, right? It exists for the police, it exists for the courts, it exists for the state itself. And in another in which it does not, the former was a view claimed by the state, right, the, that Pakistan exists, but the people who were shot dead are the ones who said that Pakistan didn't exist. The re so the resistance of the Hajongs and Nankars was not directed actually at Pakistan, a state that for them had not, come, had not yet come to be, but a past that frustrated their possibility of its arrival. So, you know, their struggle was their, their struggle and resistance. They saw it as their contribution to bringing about a future Pakistan. And what did that future Pakistan look like? It was a future that imagined radical class justice, a Goribet Pakistan, Zindabad. Now, another set of tensions emerged between the people and state during this pe period. And this con concerned the institution of the police, right? The end of colonial rule had created, and quite inevitably perhaps, questions around the future of an institution, of the future of the police, an institution that had been the visible and violent symbol and instrument of colonial power and dominance. Um, now, the answer, the answer of what should we do with the police was obvious to many. In his memoirs, Atar Rahman Khan recounts this conversation with an elderly peasant in the early days of independence, when he had been a district Muslim League leader. Now the peasant comes up to Atar Rahman Khan when he's visiting the village, and he says, um, so are there going to be any police? Are there going to be courts and kacharis and soldiers and sentries, jails and lockups, um, since we, they now have Pakistan? Atar Rahman Khan um, recalled the recoil of the, the sort of the peasant when told, of course, they would continue to exist. The peasant then angrily says, then what kind of Pakistan have we got? Change the name, please. You will name it Pakistan, yet allow sins and corruption to exist. The peasant could not comprehend the survival of an institution that had been used to enforce their subservience through violent means in this new state of freedom. 
Bashani too followed a similar thread of argument when he questioned the allocated budget for the police in the year 1948 at the Legislative Assembly. He says the duty of protecting East Pakistan is upon those who achieved it. They are determined to do that. To spend any money on the police, he declared, was a logic arbitrary. For men such as Bashani, the police, an institution that never belonged to the people, um, diminished claims to have a sort of, if we can, he basically, he was saying that if you continue to have institutions like the police, it diminishes the claims to a fully, to having a fully free and sovereign Pakistan. So what does the state do? So instead of diminishing the police presence in life, instead of abolishing it or diminishing the police presence in life, the, um, what we have is a state who was too scared. It was too scared. It was too radical a leap in the post-colonial future to have a government, um, to have a state without police. You know, this is a government that was seeing enemies everywhere. So what it does is that it reproduces the very strategies and practices and apparatus that had been used by their former rulers to repress its enemies, i.e. the people. And so this is where the tensions of the struggle between the people and the state lay. Um, so what we see, so how do the people see this? What we see with the police at that point is, so you see an untrammeled use of powers, corruption and brutality. And Pati Bibi, a Nanka tenant, tenant, described it as the signs of Chotaki, uh, Sutok, uh, Chutoki Amat. Basically, Pakistan had gone from a Chirostai Eid to a small Kiamat. You know, so her sort of, you know, her house gets entered by the police um, with the zamindars. They break her earthenware. They scatter what little rice she has, and they steal the few golden ornaments that she had. And so basically the same question comes again. Is this Pakistan? Had the future arrived? But actually it hadn't. So what we see from these early struggles and resistance is that a frustration and incompre incomprehensibility at the persistence of these old problems of poverty, violence, and joblessness in their new state. Um, and it was in this desire and effort to expunge the past, to eradicate the past and move into the future living mode that confrontation occurred. As the state sought to discipline and control borders, the state sought to control borders of all kinds, physical, social, cultural and imaginative ones. And this is, it's, and this is where Bashani comes in because he takes this feeling of a incompleteness and he foregrounds it in the politics of the Awami League Right? We have to remember that Bashani was one of the founders of the Awami League itself, and he uses it to form an effective and organized opposition to the Muslim League. So what does he do? In May 1948, just prior to the internal Muslim League elections, Bashani publishes a petition which says, right? This is the demands of the poor people. And what were these demands? These were far more these were demands that were far more far-reaching radical and utopian like than that of individual rights and equality right it stopped it was not talking about individual rights it was saying it will never be possible possible to achieve shamanic shamu without arthik shamu we will it would never be possible to achieve social equality without economic economic equality he said, we will have to destroy capitalism and feudalism from Pakistan and establish Islamic socialism. Otherwise, the people's sacrifice for freedom is useless. Now, why was this such a compelling thing? Why were peasants and workers drawn to those ideas? So what we see is that alongside this inheritance of, um, you know, and reproduction of old colonial structures, right? Old colonial structures, institutions, and policies, there's also what remains is an enduring political imagination, this enduring political imagination that was there before the partition itself. Bashani's language had belonged to the radical underbelly of ideas on Pakistan from the colonial past, and it continued to have traction in the post-colonial present. Peasants and workers felt like that they had not been abandoned to their fate, 
actually their fate had not yet arrived, right, in Pakistan. Their fate was yet to come if they could seize on it. Now, why am I sort of talking about peasants and workers' struggles and, and Bashani itself? What I'm trying to do with this, and I'm going to conclude here, um, is try to suggest that so far what we've been doing is that we've been the stories and the scholarship around the making and the unmaking of Pakistan has an elite urban bias, right? This is the focus on the language movement in itself tells a story of a different constituency. But if we were to think with peasants and workers of the future that they had intended for East Bengal, then maybe we might be able to clearly think about the present that we inhabit, the world that we live in currently, and who has what, and who doesn't have what. The, the future, has the future come? Do you think that the future has come for the people of Bangladesh yet? Um, and this is where I will end. Thank you. Dhanabad. <laughs> Samia Ebong Lairi uh, Dujun Durokum Habe partition ke Amad Shamne Hajikurat Samra Jerukum Jasha Kuratilam Kubichamutkar Amamaje Amra Kunjit Kurbo Shetatse Amad Rector Discussion Chulbe Ebong Jara Kotabul Tachan Jara Prostokur Tachan Amad Dujun Speaker Jarachan Boktatske Samia Kima Lairi Ketara Judith to Henry Scorin তাহলে আমি বুঝতে পারবো এবং আমি একটা একজন একজন করে তাদেরকে হয়তো সুযোগ করে দেব তারা যেন তাদের প্রশ্নটা করতে পারে তার আগে আমাদের বন্ধু আছে দিল্লি থেকে শ্রীময় শ্রীময়কে আমি বলবো যে আমাদের আজকের যে দুই বক্তা যা বললেন সে সম্পর্কে যদি কিছু আলোকপাত করেন এর মধ্যে যারা প্রশ্ন করতে চান তারা যদি একটু হাত তুলেন আমি একটু দেখে নিতে পারবো তাদের এর মধ্যে আজিজুল রাসেল একটা এসএমএস করেছেন এখন ছোট করে লিখেছেন আই হ্যাভ এ কমেন্ট এন্ড কোশ্চেন টু লাইলি ঠিক আছে শ্রীময় কি আছেন শ্রীময়ের ক্যামেরা বন্ধ দেখছি আছে 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 শ্রীময় শ্রীময় আপনি যদি একটু কথা বলতেন তার মধ্যে আমরা এরপরে আজিজুলের কাছে আমরা আসছি এবং রাজর সিদ্ধাজ গুপ্ত লিখেছেন হ্যাঁ আমরা একজন একজন করে আসছি শ্রীময় ছোট করে একটা বেসিক আইডিয়া যেটা বুঝতে পারলাম সেটা আমি একটু বলছি তারপরে প্রশ্ন উত্তরটা অনেক বেশি জমাটি হবে আমি আশা করছি সামিয়া যে জায়গা থেকে পার্টিশনটা দেখছেন উনি বললেন যে একটা আর্কিটেকচার অফ থট এর জায়গা থেকে যেখানে পার্টিশন আমাদের কাছে একটা ট্রুথ ভ্যালু পার্টিশনের একটা ট্রুথ ভ্যালু আছে আমাদের কাছে এবং সেই ট্রুথ ভ্যালুটার একটা কলোনিয়াল ইটস ইটস ইনফর্ম বাই আওয়ার কলোনিয়াল হিস্ট্রি শেয়ার্ড কলোনিয়াল পাস্ট যেখানে একটা ধরনের রিলিজিয়াস আইডেন্টিটি দিয়ে মডার্ন স্টেটের ক্লাসিফিকেশন হচ্ছে যেটা আমরা ইউরোপের ইতিহাস করতে গেলে রেফরমেশন কাউন্টার রেফরমেশন এবং সেই ইতিহাসটাকে ওভারকাম করার যেটা পড়ি এখানে ঠিক উল্টোটা এখানে পপুলেশন কে ভাবাই হচ্ছে রিলিজিয়াস আইডেন্টিটি দিয়ে এবং এই এখান থেকে একটা ধারণা তৈরি হচ্ছে পার্টিশনে যেটা কিন্তু পুরোপুরি টেম্পোরালিটির দ্বারা অর্থাৎ যেটার মধ্যে যেটার মূল বাস্তবটাই হচ্ছে গিয়ে যে সময় অর্থাৎ একভাবে সময়কে ভেঙে ইতিহাসের মধ্যে দিয়ে উনিশ শতকে ইতিহাসটা তো একটা খুব মাস্টার ন্যারেটিভ এর জায়গায় ছিল তো সেই ইতিহাসের মধ্যে দিয়ে একটা বিশ্লেষণ করলেন যেখানে পার্টিশনের আইডিয়াটা ইস ইমব্রিকেটেড ইন দা ইন দা ভেরি কলোনিয়াল ডিসকোর্স সেটা 
ইতিহাসের বইয়ের মাধ্যমে আমাদের কাছে আসছেন এবং এই বিষয়ে এর আগে কিছু লেখাপত্র হয়েছে এবং কিন্তু ওনার যে মেইন যেটা দেখালেন যে যে পুঁথি যে একটা ধরনের ব্যতিক্রমী অল্টারনেটিভ টেক্সটের অল্টারনেটিভ ন্যারেটিভ যেটা পার্টিশন ক্যারেক্টার উঠে আসছে এক সময়ের প্রতিভু হিসেবে তা এটা একটা ইন্টারেস্টিং ইন্টারভেনশন তা এই নিয়ে আমি আমার কমেন্ট পরে করব আমি আপাতত বক্তব্যটা আমি একটু ছোট করে বলছি সেখানে লাইলির বক্তব্য দুটো জিনিস টেনশনটা একটা টেনশন দেখাচ্ছে পার্টিশনের পোস্ট পার্টিশন যেখানে একটা ইমাজিনেশন আছে অফ হোয়াট ইস পাকিস্তান ইন আ স্টেট ডিসকোর্স যেটা বর্তমান এবং কিন্তু সেটা সেটার একটা নির্ভরযোগ্যতা সেটা সেটা খুব স্টেবল নয় কারণ হোয়াট ইস পাকিস্তান গোয়িং টু বি একটা মিলেনেরিয়ান অ্যাপিলের একটা মিলেনেরিয়ান ড্রিমের গল্প রয়েছে যেটা নেসেসারিলি বাস্তবের সাথে খাপ খাচ্ছে না এবং সেটা আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি হাজং এবং নানকার এই যে এদের ভাষ্যে এই ডিসক্রিপেন্সিটা জেনারেটেড হচ্ছে এবং একটা পলিটিক্যাল কনসিয়াসনেস এর একটা পলিটিক্যাল আর্টিকুলেশনের জায়গায় সেটা পৌঁছাচ্ছে যেখানে চিরস্থায়ী ঈদের এই মিলেনেরিয়ান অ্যাপেলটা অলওয়েজ ডেফার্ড অলওয়েজ ডেফার্ড সেটা কারণ হতেই পারে যে আমাদের সাউথ এশিয়ান সাবকন্টিনেন্টের সিটিজেনশিপের যে ন্যারেটিভ সিটিজেনশিপের আইডিয়াটা যেভাবে এসছে সেখান থেকে হতে পারে এবং ডেফিনেটলি দেখতে গেলে কিছু অনেক ঐতিহাসিক দেখেছে দেখিয়েছেন যে এই আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ডিং অফ সিটিজেনশিপ যেটা অ্যাভেলেবল ইন বেস্ট সেটা নেসেসারিলি সেইভাবে আসেনি আমাদের এখানে তা কি এসছে কি না এসছে এই কথা এই অনেক খুঁটিনাটি ইন্টারেস্টিং অবজারভেশন বেরোবে এই নেক্সট কিছুক্ষণের বক্তব্যে তাই আমি এখানেই শেষ করছি সাউন্ড প্রশ্ন হ্যাঁ শুনেছি চমৎকার হচ্ছে তিনি এটা হচ্ছে বক্তব্যের উপর একটা যে তিনি যেভাবে আসলে ইতিহাসে সম্পর্ক এই কিন্তু আমি একটা জিনিস বলতে চাই আসলে দেখি সেখানে আমি দেখব যে এক ধরনের ইস্ট ওয়েস্ট সেটা তো রয়েছে একটা দৃষ্টি কিন্তু সেখানে যে এই দেশের মধ্যে ইতিহাস করতে গিয়েও সেখানে 
মূল একটা কথা বলি যে এইটার জন্য হিন্দুরা দায়ী না মুসলমানরা দায়ী এটার জন্য জিনার হচ্ছে দায়ী না দায়ী না সেখানে এখানে এই জিনিসটা আমার মনে হয় আমাদের আপনি যে তাদের আসলে ওইভাবে হ্যাঁ লাইলি আনমিউট করে নেবেন একটু একটু হ্যাঁ আমি যতটুকু বুঝতে পারছি চক্রবর্তী what they do and how they start writing around subaltern um studies changes um and i think what i'm trying to really get at uh, and i mean i there's a lot of disagreement with dipesh chakraborty and how he imagines the collective consciousness of the present he imagines in some sense a, a consciousness that goes back to time and that doesn't in some sense change right it's it's sort of new sort of rooted to its uh, sort of it, to some sort of not primordial bonds but to particular social relationships and when the the peasant enters the workplace um they stop they never stop 
being peasants. They become their like peasant workers. And I, I disagree with that. I think that the, that the context and the situation changes um, sort of in some senses, the material con conditions also determine the sort of ideas that come into play. Um, my, my sort of, um, the reason why I took up this project in some ways is because, I mean, so far is, is a sort of a critique of subaltern studies, right? At some point it extinguishes the peasant from the, the work of the subaltern studies. It decides, it decides to see itself as a, you know, a monolithic East against the monolithic West, uh, sort of, a, and, and this is where, and I'm trying to say that there is, you know, that this isn't the, that, that, that the battles actually are quite different at different levels. So the work, the peasant and workers' battles are quite different from the petty bourgeois or, um, and, or the urban intellectual. And, and so far, what I'm seeing with the historiography around Bangladesh itself, it sort of homogenizes all of these, the sort of the, the consciousness, the Bengali consciousness is homogenized. Everyone is thinking the same way. Everyone imagines the Bengali to be the same way. It imagines a particular culture. It Im imagines a particular vocabulary or, or grammar, sort of a grammar of seeing the future in a particular way. Um, and I'm trying to suggest actually the grammar of the peasants and workers um, is quite different. In fact, it's quite radical. Right, and that's why it never comes to be. Right, the the national project is actually a quite a conservative one. The nation state is a conservative project. It's not necessarily an unimaginative sort of. It's not necessarily an imagine, imaginative project itself, because what it does is actually nothing really changes except the one who changes from where you go from the passengers from being in the passenger's seat to being in the driver's seat, and what the peasant and workers project is actually one of what is our relationship to the land? What is our relationship to labor? What is our relationship to others? How do the borders that we imagine ourselves to be, um, are those the only borders that, you know, they, it's a bit transgressive. They don't, it doesn't see borders in the same way. Um, and that's, and I, I'm looking at futures that never came to be, right? The national liberation future, in some ways, is the future that we're, the present that we're living in. And I'm trying to understand who's dissatisfied, who's not satisfied with the present, with the present moment that we're living in. Um, so I don't know if Azizul, like this answered your question, but that's <laughs> yeah. As you will say, the, uh, I agree with your disagreement. Great. So so fantastic. Lyle, take over. Um, can I take a little time? Uh, can I get? Masood, by one minute, I'm going to talk to you. 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 Just uh, to talk about the future. Uh, what, to, what to do in future? We have talked the history, but uh, still not we have talked uh, about the future of these three, three countries. No? Uh, as we, uh, we talked, that we, go, uh, we have gone back to 47. No? Uh, three mm. countries have uh, gone back to 47. Now we are to, uh, 2020, and uh, uh, further in the future, what relation we can develop these three, three countries? Because re political relation is not visible for these countries. That uh, Pakistan's interest with another country, India's interest, and Bangladesh's interest, all interests, are, we are divided still now, uh, more divided uh, uh, in like in 47. Uh, so I am thinking about the future. Laila and or any one of you I mean, can think about this. Thank you. Thank you, Masood Bhai, for your comments. So, I mean, Rajor Shike to Bulbo, Rajor Shi, Prosto Kurtatse, Dujonke, Target Shu Bashat, Rajor Shi Dash Gupto, Dili Take. Donovad, the Bong Dujonke, Donovad, Vishon Monograhi, Bokrita Jono, Atta Shankip to Shomoy Mote. আমি চেষ্টা করব বক্তাদের সুরের সঙ্গে সুর মিলিয়ে কিছুটা ইংলিশে কিছুটা বাংলায় যাতে প্রশ্নগুলো করতে পারি তাতে আমার মনে হয় সবারই সুবিধা হবে শুরুটা আমি করব সামিয়া তিনি যদি থাকেন তাকে দু তিনটি প্রশ্ন করে প্রথমেই বলি যে 
আপনার জিওগ্রাফিক্যাল অর্ডারিং এর বদলে টেম্পোরাল অর্ডারিং বা পার্টিশন কে একরকম সময় বা কালের খন্ডীকরণ হিসেবে দেখা এটা আমার চমৎকার লেগেছে আমার ভীষণ ইন্টারেস্টিং এবং এক্সাইটিং একটা প্রপোজিশন মনে হয়েছে এবং আমি আরো জানতে চাইবো পড়তে চাইবো এই ভাবনাটা আপনি কোন দিকে নিয়ে যেতে চাইছেন সে বিষয় আমার প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে যে এই সময় বা কালের খন্ডীকরণ যেটা আপনি ইম্পিরিয়াল হিস্ট্রি দিয়ে দেখাচ্ছেন জেমস মিল থেকে শুরু করে তার সঙ্গে সাম্রাজ্যের সম্পর্ক আমরা জানি কিন্তু এই সময় বা কালের খন্ডীকরণের উপর ভিত্তি করে যে জিওগ্রাফিক্যাল অর্ডারিংটা হয়েছে যে ভৌগোলিক খন্ডীকরণটা হয়েছে তার সঙ্গে পুঁজির সম্পর্কটা কি বা ক্যাপিটালের সম্পর্কটা কি সেটা আর কি কি ফাংশন প্লে করে এইটা আপনার কাছে একটা প্রশ্ন দ্বিতীয় প্রশ্ন যেটা এটা আমি জানতে চাই এবং আজকে সুযোগ পেয়েছি বলে আপনাকে করছি ডিকলোনাইজিং যে অ্যাপ্রোচ বা ডিকলোনাইজিং যে পার্সপেকটিভ থেকে আপনারা কথা বলেন বা আপনি বলছেন আজকে সেটার থেকে পোস্ট কলোনিয়াল পার্সপেকটিভের ডিফারেন্সটা কি দুটোর মধ্যে কি কোনো ফান্ডামেন্টাল ডিফারেন্স আছে আমি আরো এই কারণে জিজ্ঞেস করছি তার কারণ হচ্ছে যে আপনি যদি আপনার বক্তৃতাটাকে আমি উদাহরণ হিসেবে ধরি তাহলে আপনি আমাদের একটা অন্যরকম ইতিহাস বোধ বা অন্যরকম ইতিহাস চর্চার উদাহরণ তুলে ধরলেন ওই পুঁথিটির সাহায্যে যেটা ইম্পিরিয়াল সেন্স অফ হিস্ট্রি বা টিপিক্যালি প্রগ্রেসিভ হিস্ট্রি থেকে আলাদা কিন্তু যে উদাহরণটা আপনি আমাদের দিলেন সেটি কিন্তু ছাপা পুঁথি সেটা ইংরেজরা আসার পরে প্রিন্টিং প্রেস নামক যন্ত্রটি আসার পরে ছাপা হয়েছে এবং আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি তিনটে সময় সেখানে একসাথে পাশাপাশি চলেছে সেখান থেকে আমরা পেছন দিকে তাকিয়ে যখন অন্য ধরনের অতীত বোধ বা অতীত চেতনাকে আমরা ভাবতে চাইছি তখন এই ধরনের উদাহরণ থেকে কতটা সেটাকে ধরতে পারা সম্ভব কারণ এই উদাহরণটা নিজেই একটা সময়ের ফসল একটা সময়ের এভিডেন্স এবং তার আগের যে অতীত চেতনা বা কনসিয়াসনেস যদি বলি আমরা সেটাকে কি হিস্ট্রি বলাটা সমীচীন হবে সেটা কি আমরা যে অর্থে ইতিহাস বুঝি সেই অর্থে ইতিহাস তার মধ্যে কালের যে গতিমুখ আছে সেই গতিমুখ কি কোন ধরনের এটা যদি আপনি একটু খোলসা করে বলেন এটা আমার ডক্টর সামিয়া প্রশ্ন রাজশ্রীরে <laughs> 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 কিন্তু এই কঠিন প্রশ্নের জন্যই এরকম স্পেস আমাদের দরকার কারণ ইউ চ্যালেঞ্জড মি লেট মি সে ইফ আই ক্যান ম্যাচ বাই থিংকিং অন মাই ফেট হিয়ার সো আই উইল গেট ব্যাক টু হুইচ ডাইরেকশন আই এম গোইং উইথ দিস থিংকিং अबाउट টেম্পোরালিটি এন্ড অফ কোর্স আন্ডার নো সারকামস্ট্যান্সেস অ্যাম আই দি ওনলি দি ফার্স্ট পারসন অর আ নিউ পারসন টু বি টকিং अबाउट টেম্পোরালিটি the problem of time in history the problem of the coloniality of time and modern time is a problem that historians have been re- post colonial historians have grappled with you know you know in a very 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 rigorous way what um so i want to just you said what is the relationship um between these different forms of geography that um take hold during colonialism or um if if i understood correctly what what is the relationship between these geographical entities and capitalism now i'm uh, not just just a moment can yeah? i can i briefly clarify what i yeah. meant was um, i really like your proposition about temporal ordering thinking about partition in those terms what i meant was that this temporal ordering then translates into a geographical ordering well, how do we think about the relationship of that geographical ordering with capital as different okay. from empire so what what function does it play 
what uh, role does it play what is its relationship with capital if we are to you know if, if one imagines uh, one can imagine in those terms i mean so what as i understand it the this this temporal ordering has at the apex of it the spatial category of the nation right the spatial category of the nation as the destination point towards which we are all marching as humanity so i understand the geographical entity that is connected to the architecture as shown to be about the nation now the emergence of industrialized capitalism and the emergence of the nation state in its modern form are of course absolutely um completely tied to each other i guess the particular moment that my new work is going towards is that very specific moment where this story of progress is emerging alongside a new form of racial capitalism that has as its end point the white nation as its imagined destination point so you know i the in many ways you've asked the question that i will be able to answer once i have actually sunk my teeth into my new project which allows me to actually say that what i understand the british empire to have been is not only a colonization of the economic systems and the governmentality systems etc but also of course an epistemic colonization so my very my new project which i'm extremely excited about is actually about teasing out what the sort of connectedness between the epistemic colonization and the economic colonization is and in particular looking very much at how what what does it mean to start seeing in this particular way and what does it mean for being able to imagine anti-capitalist uh futures or futures beyond capitalism the way that the the colonization of hope in a sense is what happens during this uh, you know from from that very early late 18th century period of um, east india company rule so i i haven't answered very concretely what the what the relationship between those that temporal structure that spatial structure and capitalism is except to say that they're contemporaneous and my new project goes literally to that late 18th century moment to try and find out what those connections are because in sort of looking at archives i'm working with i'm going to be working on textile workers in that early um period of colonial rule and what i get to see from the archives already is that not only are the systems of trade being colonized but also systems of how you move not only are systems of how commodities move being colonized but also how imaginatively people beings plants are imagined to be moving through yesterday today tomorrow so those different circuits of movement both economic and temporal how they're interconnected you so you you i i hope that i will have a better answer for you <laughs> as this project uh um kind of evolves now the second question about the book is a printed booty and you know it's very much inside colonial modernity in it's printed in 1860 the people who are writing it are you know they're absolutely implicated in all the various different institutions that produce colonial modern subjectivity however i would argue that the epistemic ground that that puthi is written on actually has a continuous has a genealogy that we can trace to far longer than colonial rule and it it becomes a strange thing where you can't even talk about time in that way it's almost like it's an epistemic ground that continues to exist in the in the botala presses in the various different spaces that are you know colonized by capitalism and imperialism but they kind of continue to exist and sustain other forms of subjectivity and your question about can we even call these forms of things history i guess this is where i would 
this is one of the ways in which I would say the post-colonial project and the decolonizing project might be different. I think that the the, the age of post-colonial scholarship and scholars was very much tied in with that ambivalent sense of the post-colonial nation state sort of failing. It came with all this promise, but it, it's, it's failing, it's failing, it's failing. And that generation of historians and thinkers, I think were profoundly uncomfortable with the idea of Actually, what if we read something like the Kasas Alambia? What if we read something like Ab Australian Aboriginal narratives about the past? What if we look at what philosophy of time they're using apart from progress? What if we use those today to write histories? What if we actually claim that those are modes of thinking that have not been superseded by modernity, have not been superseded by the philosophy of progress. So th that would be my distinction between the post-colonial project and the decolonizing project. The decolonizing project, I would, uh, decolonizing history project, I would describe as Go, in this, in, this is a very Samia only definition, I'm sure <laughs> there's not many people out there who would maybe share this definition, but I would say to actually value and pay attention to those modes of thinking as modes that have not died and are actually still alive and available to us to do historical storytelling. So I think I've spoken enough. So I look forward to hearing Lali's questions. Okay, Rajushi. Thank you very much. Lali, uh, act up Jodi Ami Babe Bolte Pari Act Honor, moral imaginary of mm. freedom, of mm. independent nation. So mm. uh, at a big call put Harona uh, Apni Nishu Janin, J. Uh, Harod Porsho, uh, Erokom at the Jagateke, at a Shoma slogan Ukechilo, Shatuli Shirpore, Yazadi Juta Juti Juti. Mm. Mm. Uh, আমাকে একটু মনে পড়িয়ে দিলো আমি আপনাকে যে প্রশ্নটা করতে চাই দুই তিনটে প্রশ্ন একটা হচ্ছে যে প্রথম প্রশ্নটা একটু রিভিশনিস্ট হ্যাঁ প্রশ্নটা হচ্ছে ইজ ইট পসিবল দ্যাট দিস কাইন্ড অফ র‍্যাডিক্যাল ইমেজিনেশনস লাইক দ্যাট অফ মাওলানা ভাসানি দে গেট ইনস্ট্রুমেন্টালি ইউজড এভরি টাইম ইন ফার মোর প্র্যাগম্যাটিক এন্ড অপরচুনিস্টিক projects larger projects like you know that of the modern nation state yes um ei biplobi kalpana ki bar bar erokom mane ek dhoroner subidhabad ki khomota poran prokolper ongsho hoye jay eta ei ki bhogitobbo eta thik proshno noy kintu tobu ar ki apnake uske debar jonno bola ditiyo ota hocche ek dhoroner montobbo apni je bhabe maulana bhashani ke imagine korchen Mm. Uh, I am hangover, but I am immediately reminded of the notion of organic intellectual mm. by Gramsci. Yes. And uh, uh, your fleshing out of Maulana Bhasani really seems to me to, you know, kind of illustrate that kind of a figure of organic yes. intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, Molana Bhasani J Bhuvishotir Kalpona. The future, mm -hmm. the imaginary future that Molana Bhasani is talking about. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that that future is always outside time? A Bhuvishot Shop Shomai, Shomoy Baide, Amra Loki Korte Jibabi Shomoy Bhabi. Is it possible that that future is basically, you know, some kind of a theological horizon? Uh, this mm -hmm. is a sense that you know i'm sorry but uh, i need to refer to somebody like walter benjamin uh, <laughs> yes who brings together these kind of ideas yeah so mm -hmm. 
uh, it is not a sort of achievable uh, future je ei bhabishyat kalker bhabishyat ba porshur bhabishyat kintu ei bhabishyat sobshomoy samne mele dhora thakbe jedike takiye andolan e giye jabe emon ta ki bhaba jete par ei bas ei tin ti proshno ami onno der shomoy ni nichi um in some ways they're not they thank you very much for the actually i've been looking for this opportunity for an interaction with uh rajashi and i'm really glad that i'm having it here um so are we i mean in some ways you know you said are these radical imaginations um you know instrumentally used opportunistically used but of course i mean if you think about I mean, this is controversial in many senses, but um, but I mean, not controversial, but the sort of the idea of socialism or the Awami League in itself adopts the agenda, right, um, of socialism in 1970. Now, this is after a groundswell of movement has, um, you know, one that in some ways starts with Maulana Bashani, um and and where he takes on this project of islamic socialism to heart i mean this is where um the, so you know the awami league itself opportunistically uses is, uh, socialism they don't say islamic socialism but they use the socialism to say look um you know we have no opposition now we have no opposition we have now used socialism we've got the six points we've got socialism and therefore there is no need for bashani but there's always i mean so and and you see it in current i mean in some ways everyone's using because what is it a promise of why shouldn't it be instrumentally opportunistically used it it's a it's an idea of something that hasn't come to be something that's desired something that's wanted you're going at the deepest cravings and deepest sort of of people and you know it you're tapping into it but uh, and so of course the radical imagination is there to be used and um and 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 therefore and it has been used and it continues to be used to this very day i mean if we think about and this is a talk about i mean samia started a question about who's who is a left or who i mean maybe she didn't say left or who's a a communist but you know she asked who is a progressive um and this you know there there is an adoption of within the urban left in dhaka or elsewhere of bashani but what we see with the left in bangladesh is what i gather a retreat from the rural right the rural has been left to the um to be captured by other groups by groups that actually opposed bashani and called him a kafir so i think yes i agree with you that the the radical imagination is there to be used i mean is is there and it's and it is used opportunistically in in many ways and um by other groups who have no who have no desire for it really because it it involves turning a society upside down you're over you you're basically saying the society that you see and people fear that the most right you actually the, the, the people who benefit from this like it the most anyway so yes and of course i see pashani as someone who's been um who is an organic intellectual um in and and i do use gramscian notions and the and sort of of the organic intellectual with when it comes to pashani in some ways what what sort of tells you pashani as an organ sort of is an organic intellectual is that when you go to the official archives you see nothing but there in terms of the mention of you see the only mention that there is of bashani there is a troublemaker a nuisance a fool a, a rustic idiot but if you come and then that's it really i mean there's this ridicule there's this disdain and the disdain comes basically by virtue of the fact that he is not their man right that he is not their man so um this is someone that, and that he is not an establishment figure where you get the real stories around bashani are those actually um is by his presence in people's lives i've gone to several talks i've given several talks now and everyone has a little story to tell about bashani as to i am not interested in the veracity of the story but i am interested in the fact that everyone has a story to tell of bashani whether how he rode a boat how he um eight fish what kind of fish he ate 
what he did with the, you know, where he slept and all of these things. And what does this tell you other than this is a person that's being organized and directed by people. Um, and it tells you something when actually Bashani, if you think about him, is the only river Rhine leader of Bangladesh. Um, because nobody else uses the boat as, I mean, the Awami League uses the, let's say, uh, but I mean, nobody uses the boat as their mode of transport. No other leader. I mean, before that, there were other leaders who were using the boat of transport, but Mujib and others are not using the boat as their mode of transport. If anyone understands, and Bashani is using that to go to the chores. He's going to go to those places. He understands the terrain and landscape of South Asia. He understands it of the River Rhine Delta that he's living in. So that's, uh, I mean, I could go on about this, but uh, I'll stop there. And is the radical imagination out of time? Is, does it sit outside? There's a fine, an Im the radical imagination is, an Im is in some ways. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I, mean, I mean the idea of the future that you keep talking about in Bhasan. The future, does it stand Is that outside future of time? Out that, that's right. Yes, in some ways it is outside of time, right? If we take Benjamin and if we take others, it, is, it, stands, um, it stands outside of time. It's an imagined, it's an imagined space, but it doesn't completely stand outside of time because it is also, there's a possibility the politics that he plays, right? The mobilization of the masses means that it doesn't, it is not outside, it, is, it doesn't stand completely outside of time itself. It has the possibility of moving into time. It has the possibility of moving into a, a sort of a future. So it's, it's, it's a nowhere space, right? Where does utopia happen? It happens in this nowhere space. It's, it's that space where you can go to where nothing, exists and you populate it with what you want to exist. So in some ways it stands in a place where there is no time. But if you, I think this is where the uh, sort of the grassroots, um, the politics comes in, right? Bashani's politics. Bashani is not just imagining it for you. He's actually, actually, you know, he's actually putting it into place so that it comes back into time. Um, and, and, and you see that in 1969. So the story of 1969 so far has been the story of the students, right? It's been the story of, um, it's been the story of the urban intellectual. Now, actually, it's actually a story of the people who were coming from the villages, who were mobilizing around. You see the more radical and sort of activities and practices happening within the villages. There's actually, there's people's trials being held had there's um there's various things that are happening within the villages that the urban intellectuals or the urban press or the urban students are terrified of they're terrified of a future they start building up these peace committees to stop the mobilization of things that are happening in the rural area they're actually saying what's happening in the rural areas is anarchy now that's another thing right so this is what is you know anarchy and the rallying sort of you know and other things stand outside of, so I think you know, they stand outside of time. And so it's that possibility of the radical imagination being brought into time that I think is, is something that Bashani is doing. I'm not sure if I under, you know, answered your question. And actually, I wanted to throw it back at you, if that's possible, Rajarshi, as to whether you saw the radical or the future, whether that sits outside of time. I would really like to uh, have more conversations with you okay, over yeah, email, sure. maybe, or on but some other question. For some now, other I think yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank uh, you. Over to Shaun and you. Yeah. Thank you, Laili, Samia, and Rajarshi. Shundurikti Alchana Hulu. Amar Apnader Kotha Shunta Shunte. Amader A. Ostro Archive here. Unutomo Rubokar. Mohammed Nasiruddiner Kotha Munipuregalo. Mohammed Nasiruddin. A আপনার যে সময়ের কথা বলছেন উনি ছিলেন সরাসরি মাওলানা ভাসানীর সঙ্গে যুক্ত এবং আমাদের আর্কাইভে কিছু ম্যাটেরিয়াল আছে সেই সময়কার যেগুলো উনি সংগ্রহ করেছিলেন এবং ওনার কাছে আমরা লাইদি যেরকম বললেন যে প্রচুর গল্প এরকম প্রচুর গল্প ভাসানীর সম্পর্কে আমরাও ওনার কাছ থেকে শুনেছি সেই গল্প বলার জায়গা আজকে নয় আমাদের সময় শেষ হয়ে আসছে 
অনেকে কথা বলার জন্য প্রশ্ন করার জন্য আছে আমি দেখতে পাচ্ছি সঞ্জয় চক্রবর্তীকে সঞ্জয় চক্রবর্তী ঢাকা বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের চারুকলা বিভাগের আর্টিস্টের অধ্যাপক সঞ্জয় প্লিজ সঞ্জয় লাইনে সমস্যা হচ্ছে মনে হয় হ্যাঁ এবার করার জন্য কারণ পার্টিশন নিয়ে আসলে আমাদের সবারই খুব আগ্রহ এবং এর যে এর যে ব্যাপ্তি আসলে এটা জানাটা খুব প্রয়োজন এখনকার সময় এটা খুবই প্রাসঙ্গিক তো আমার প্রশ্ন মূলত হচ্ছে সামিয়া খাতুনকে উনি যে বিষয়টা নিয়ে উনি মানে আলোচনা করলেন আর কি তো যে জিনিসটা উনি আসলে কনসেপ্ট অফ প্রোগ্রেস নিয়ে উনি আলোচনাটা করেছিলেন তো আমি আপনার কাছে যে প্রশ্নটা করতে চাচ্ছি সেটা হচ্ছে কাঁচা ছোল কাঁচা ছোল আম্বিয়া বলে যেই পুথিটার আপনি রেফারেন্স দিয়েছেন যতটুকু আমি জানি এটা আসলে মধ্যযুগের মানে মধ্যযুগের শেষের দিকের আসলে সাহিত্য মানে পুঁথি সাহিত্য যেটা যদিও এটা পাবলিশ হচ্ছে মানে ব্রিটিশ সময়ে এসে প্রেসে কিন্তু এটা এই ধরনের পুঁথিগুলো হাতে লিখে কপি হতো এবং এগুলো মূলত হচ্ছে শহরের বাইরে তখন তো আরবান এরিয়াটা কম ছিল শহরের বাইরের মানুষরা হচ্ছে এই ধরনের পুঁথিগুলো পাঠ করত এবং এই যে বটতলাতে এই যে পুঁথিগুলো ছাপা হচ্ছে এগুলো মোটেও এগুলো আরবান আরবান লাইফ মধ্যযুগের যে ধর্মীয় যে ধর্মীয় যে সহাবস্থানের জায়গাটা যদিও সেটা ধর্ম নিরপেক্ষতার বিষয়টা আমি প্রথমে চিন্তা করেছিলাম কিন্তু পরে আমি আমার আমার যিনি হচ্ছে গাইড তার সাথে যখন আমি আলোচনা করেছিলাম সহাবস্থানের বিষয়গুলো ছিল এবং সেখান থেকে প্রচুর টেক্সট তৈরি হয়েছে মানে সেখানে আমরা আলাউল সৈয়দ সুলতান এরকম অনেক অনেক পুঁথি লেখকদের পাচ্ছি তো অনেক পুঁথি সাহিত্য আমরা পাচ্ছি যেখানে হচ্ছে এই যে ধর্মীয় বিষয়গুলোর যে সহাবস্থান সেগুলো প্রচুর উদাহরণ আছে তো আমি আসলে আপনাকে যে প্রশ্নটা করার সেটা হচ্ছে যে যেই রেফারেন্সটা আপনি আমাদের সামনে দাঁড় করাচ্ছেন মানে যেটা হচ্ছে পার্টিশনের আলোচনার প্রেক্ষিতে বা প্রোগ্রেসের প্রেক্ষিতে আমাদের সামনে উপস্থিত হলো যদিও এটা আসলে কনসেপ্ট অফ প্রোগ্রেসকে আমরা যেভাবে দেখতে চাচ্ছি যে যে হয়তো সেকুলার স্টেটের দিকে আমরা ইমাজিন করতে চাচ্ছি বা আমাদের আমাদের ভিতরে যে ইচ্ছা আছে সেটার সেটার সূত্র কিন্তু এর মধ্যেও আছে তো কিন্তু যে রেফারেন্সটা আপনি নিচ্ছেন সেটা প্রান্তিক জনগণের আবার যে জায়গাটায় আমরা এখন আলোচনা করছি সেটা হচ্ছে সেটা হচ্ছে এই এই যে আরবান ইন্টেলেকচুয়াল ওরিয়েন্টেড জায়গা এবং সেখানে আবার এই যে কনসেপ্ট অফ সেকুলারিজম কনসেপ্ট অফ রিলিজিয়াস কারণ আমি এর রেফারেন্স নেওয়ার যে জায়গাটা আর যে পরিপ্রেক্ষিতে সেটা উপস্থিত হচ্ছে সেই জায়গাটা এই দুটোকে আমি আসলে বুঝতে চাচ্ছি মানে আপনার আলোচনার প্রেক্ষিতে আর আরেকটা বিষয় আমি এটাও আপনাকে প্রশ্ন করার ছিল সেটা হচ্ছে এটা আমার দ্বিতীয় কোয়েশ্চেন সেটা হচ্ছে আসলে আমি জানতে খুব আগ্রহী যে অস্ট্রেলিয়াতে বাংলায় হচ্ছে মানে একটা মধ্যযুগের পুঁথি কি করে গেল এটা আমার আসলে জানার খুব ইচ্ছা যদি আপনি বলেছেন সেটা একটা অন্য স্টোরি কিন্তু যদি এই তথ্যটা আপনি বলতে না ধন্যবাদ তো এই দ্বিতীয় প্রশ্নটা খুব সহজে আমি উত্তর দিতে পারি একটা বই লিখেছি আমি এটার নাম অস্ট্রেলিয়ার নাম বুঝছেন কিভাবে জিনিসটা অস্ট্রেলিয়ায় গেছে কারা এটা কারা পুঁথি পাঠ করছিল ওখানে এসব নিয়ে ওই ওই খানে লিখেছি আমি এখন যে জিনিসটা নিয়ে আসলে চিন্তিত বা মানে যে জিনিস নিয়ে চিন্তা করছি হচ্ছে যে এই যে একটা প্রথম বইটা যে লিখলাম সেটা আমি Basically, basically, I discovered that you can, 
you can use other philosophies of history to write history today. And so I want to, you know, so I'm moving away from the, actually some of the categories that you used in your first question. text. If we think about even the term Modhojuko, Kisher Modho, of course, it's a translation of the Middle Ages. So what I'm interested in is if we take this idea of the partition as the way I talked about it today, and we go to, this is actually a process that's happening right across the world. It's not specific to South Asia. The partition of the past into three sections, ancient, Middle Ages, and modern. I want to reject this as a mode of thinking that should be structuring history for social justice purposes. Now that's a very big thing to say because of course this partition of ancient, middle, modern, this is a three-part partition that actually fundamentally underpins Marxist historiography as well. It underpins the work of, you know, the, the majority of historians who have understood themselves to be part of a justice-based historical um, and political project or social justice historical project and a left historical, uh, a left political project. So, I, I, I reject that as a category that should be structuring our thought. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Of course it exists. Samia, uh, excuse me. If I just finish, if I can just finish what um, the the what I want to think about is if you, re I mean, it doesn't. I'm not. I don't want to say that there aren't a whole world of people who are thinking in these categories. I'm just saying if you step away from them, if you take the spirit of something like the Casa Salambia, which says actually you can think along many different axes of time then we don't have to reject ancient modern you know ancient middle ages and modern we can go okay that's one axis along which we can see the universe and the world what are the other axes what are the other lines along which we can think and this actually reminds me of the question that Rajashi asked Laili about is utopia outside of time uh, you know, that, that was an incredibly interesting question to think about in terms of if you think of time as, as various different streams along which you can actually imagine the future, then it, the utopia, utopia in the sense that Bhashani and is imagining and Laili is writing about, I want to actually know how many different streams of time can you view that along? But um, I've gotten a bit abstract, so maybe I'll stop there. And your second question, oh no, your second question was about Australia. Yeah, that, that one's already, uh, you know, in sort of readable form now, the answer. Samia, there is one thing I want to add. Uh, cons I consciously uh, didn't use the word Middle Age. Because Middle Age bolte actually je jinishta Europe, tar understanding theke jeta dekhiye chhe. Moddho juk kintu tadir, tara moddho, tadir je Middle Age bole je anthokar juk teke tara dekhat chhe. আমাদের মধ্যযুগ কিন্তু সেরকম না আমাদের মধ্যযুগের আমি এইজন্য মধ্যযুগ শব্দটা বাংলাতেই ব্যবহার করেছি rather than use the word middle age so আমাদের মধ্যযুগের গল্পটা একদম অন্য রকমই মানে যেটা হচ্ছে মানে কারণ সুলতানের সময়ে যে বেঙ্গল সালতানাত যেটা ছিল বেঙ্গল সালতানাতে কিন্তু অনেক রকমের টেক্সট তৈরি হয়েছে যেটাতে হচ্ছে হিন্দু মুসলিম জাক্সটাপোজের যে বিষয়টা সেটা খুব অসাধারণ ভাবে এই কারণে কিন্তু এই যে 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 Texter reference up with the same texter mode AJ Bivino Dormir J reference bull actor shut at a blend way against it. It is Shuno Purano with it. Do they share a Modujuge would say Rochonakon? A Modujuge I think the Moda allows so it's Sultan. So Amade Modujuge J Mani J J text J literature J Shahito shit act them Bino Rokomit. Rather than to the compare could I'm not European uh, Middle Ages. Ajun Ami Middle Age of the Babari Kuri. Of course, Kinto Ami Jajinista Volvo, a Motoju category to the Afni Kozen with text color mute, Afni to Pabena. Abe Habe, Mane, it are it are at a valence it a unuroko, Middle Ages, both the Chamin for a European history, the Taka Motojuger, Unor at a valence yatsek into Tobu, Aja, a 
এই পার্টিশন এই এই ক্যাটাগরিটাই কিন্তু ইটস বর্ন অফ কলোনিয়াল মডার্নিটি এন্ড এট ডাজন আই মিন একদম আই আইম 100% উইথ ইউ দ্যাট you know modhyog bolte ja mean kore ekta khubi roshik ekta mojar ekta literary and cultural and philosophical and political body of thought but it i i think it's very difficult to get away from the fact that it is a ref, it's a take it's a taking of and reflection of that particular colonial modern partition of time and we can continue conversation about what what the implications of calling it what the juke are but i don't want to take up time from other people ba uh fantastic alochona jome uthche amra aro dui ekta prashton dite chai sajjad zahid kushtia theke sajjad zahid sajjad হ্যালো হ্যালো সামিয়া 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 ঠিক আছে Sajjad Zahid from Kushtia Archive, both uh, Laili and uh, Samia, you are most welcome. Uh, the last answer you gave to uh, uh, Shonjai Chakraborty, before that I was wondering, like, uh, and uh, let me say that it, is, it was, uh, I was going through the uh, Google and finding your <laughs> fantastic discovery of Columbia and the story and all the shit etc etc in the chat box and I was going through that I I I I I heard about you but I I this is the first time I am talking to you regarding your uh, discovery of Kasas uh, Columbia however so one great intellectual of our country Bangladesh uh, Ahmed Safa uh, in his uh, uh, বাঙালি মুসলমানের মন বাঙালি মুসলমানের মন সেখানে আহমদ সফা চমৎকার ভাবে যেটা এর আগে সঞ্জয় বলছিলেন বা অনেকের আলোচনা তো এসছে বাঙালি মুসলমানের মনের মধ্যে কিভাবে যেটা আপনি বলেছেন কাসলাম বিয়ার দুইটা বোধ মিথস্ক্রিয়া ঘটেছে টু রিলিজিয়ান ক্যারেক্টার এক্সেট্রা এক্সেট্রা উনি এটা বুঝিয়েছেন যে কিভাবে এই পুঁথির বিকাশটা হলো এবং মুসলমানরা এখানে কিভাবে তারা পুঁথি অর্থাৎ অল্প বিদ্যা নিয়েও তারা এই মুসলমানদের এই চরিত্র গুলাকে নানাভাবে গিয়ে এগুলো রচনা করা এবং সেখানে নানা রকম গপ্প কিস্সা সেখানে এসছে এবং আহমদ সাফা আমার আমি নিশ্চিত যে এখানে সবাই কম বেশি আহমদ সাফা পড়েছে এবং সেখানে উনি অনেক এক্সাম্পল দিয়েছেন এখানে সেটা একটা জিনিস ছিল but you emphasized on actually the rewriting of history rewriting the history that was created by the west or the european colonizer uh, you wanted to make you want to make a new kind of way of thinking of uh, writing history like the first second third the partition of uh, like uh, talking about europe and their uh, in the european quote unquote middle age and their problem country religious conflict protestant catholics they had lots of lots of conflict and bloodshed actually and somehow they survived uh, i'm not sure you are living in uk and you know that uh, whether they have overcome this problem catholic protestant but uh, in history as we read history and uh, they are uh, like uh, talking about secularism and religious point of view somehow we okay they have overcome this problem and like uh, in our country uh, now or in, not in our country like in the subcontinent now after uh, hearing all these things the discussion and reading is i don't see any, any hope now because uh, like uh, okay shonjay talked about like uh, people uh, in different religion they were living in uh, harmony etc etc but why i don't find that because uh, because uh, there were there were always this kinds of conflicts between uh, somehow some part okay they were living 
with harmony etc but there are always this uh, religious conflict so when uh, and sanjay uh, uh, talking about like okay uh, by the colonizers uh, somehow we try to learn the this for future and uh, talking about uh, uh, like future talking about imagining the future my question is like which point or which belief was dominant here always the secular part living with harmony or the conflicting part there were always conflict between hindu or different uh, religion in this subcontinent uh, because we, we you know always the, this the similar thing happened in africa in the caribbean in africa with marcus garvey and uh, pan africanism in caribbean uh, with ms cesar with the negritude uh, now uh, they wanted to move forward uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is uh, believing or accepting the present condition present status they want to move forward so what should be our uh, move like looking forward uh, in which context like uh, believing all these things secularism or religious something what is the solution uh, and also for lily also i don't find any solution here though that uh, that that is uh, uh, with Bhashani, Goriber Pakistan, now Goriber Bangladesh, we don't see, we, we, we see the see, similar thing is happening in Bangladesh now. Mm -hmm. So we should start with Goriber Bangladesh now. Uh, is there why any not? hope? Uh -huh. Okay, why not? Definitely, why not? But that is actually the real hope. So I find real hope with Lili's Goriber Pakistan. Now we can make Goriber Bangladesh. But I don't find any uh, any any good hope with this deconstructing history. Okay, we can learn history. We can find a lot of things, uh, but I don't find any optimism here. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, I guess the what I want to say to start with is you asked you know whether or not they've gotten over the problems here in europe <laughs> just uh you know at the tail end of um the terrible terrible deaths coming out of covid what became very clear is the way that the racial distribution of injustice and the racial distribution of class violence in this country is just completely tied with the history of empire and the ongoing history of violence against non-white peoples. And one of the ways that I'm understanding, I don't know how much um, this received coverage in Bangladesh, but I imagine it did, the, the moment that the statue was toppled in Bristol into the river, Edward Colston, a slave trader, his statue was thrown into the river. What I understood that moment to be asking for by the Black Lives Matter protesters who did the throwing of that statue into the river is a call for not just a, a different kind of history that doesn't actually hold up this story about white man at the pinnacle of human civilization, but also a call for different forms of subjectivity. Now, this is course a very um, again a very me um, viewpoint on that particular event as I understand it this act of writing history this act of partitioning history the past into three these are all fundamental acts that are about the construction of human subjectivity and human consciousness. So I understand the act of actually revisiting those sites of violence and re reapplying, you know, what what other different knowledges we can bring to the construction of subjectivities. I understand that to be absolutely fundamental to actually being able to get beyond this paradigm of difference that colonial modernity has left us with. And that, that all sounds quite 
that sounds quite abstract. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but you've made me think in terms of, you know, how do I, how, where is the hope in the kind of work that I'm doing? And I want to just say that it's not about harmony. I'm not interested so much in harmony. Historically, I'm not interested in going and finding examples of where people were living well together. That's not really my project. It's about how are people in other systems of thought relating to the other? Because I, I believe that in the system of colonial modernity that we've inherited, it's, we're in a prison where it's, there's some fundamental flaws with how we can even think about difference and the other. So it's not entirely about harmony, but actually about trying to e excavate and also architect new ways of thinking about racial difference, gender difference, sexuality, a range of different forms of difference. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm very excited to encounter Ahmed Sofa's work. I haven't actually encountered his work in writing. I've encountered his work through the wonderful Solimullah Khan at UHAP, but it's, I haven't actually myself read Ahmed Sofa, so I look forward to stepping into the world of people having long thought about the intellectual heritage that the Bhutti literature and the various other forms of literature have actually given us. Um, but you're absolutely right in the sense that it's a very important question to be asking about hope because one of the things that's become really obvious when I go into the classroom, when I go into the history classroom, one of the things that happens is if you take away this story of progress from young people, they will say, well, you've taken away hope. You've actually taken away the hope of a better future. But as I understand it, it's our job to actually go, what, are, what is the fundamental flaws in this story of hope that we've been trapped in for a very, very, very long time? Um, how else could we think about better futures? I guess that's the question I'm asking. Thank you. Uh, over to Lily to answer your bit of the complex questions. Um, I I think I'm going to say, as long as a working class historian is talking to you about futures, then there must be hope, right? I think what, what we, Apne J. Bolton, why should we now think of a Goribir Bangladesh? I mean, imagine what that would look like, right? And perhaps it's not possible for us to imagine because we no longer see ourselves as Gauri, right? Or we don't even want to, I'm, I'm just saying, and I, I think, you know, as long as we're, I mean, this is a very non, sort of, a, I'm, not, I'm giving you a non-historic, like I'm not referring back to Bashani and I'm not referring back to sort of the work that I'm doing. But I think, you know, we live not just in binaries, but the possibility of, we live with antithesis as well. As long as there's capital, there is an anti-capitalist form of thought. There is a way, as long as there are oppressors, there are oppressed. As long as there are those who cannot imagine, there are those who can imagine as well. And so we have to live with the fact that there in our society, that there are dreamers, that there are workers, that there are those who imagine, that there are those who create, and there are those who are still willing to remake the world. There are those, there are those who are willing to ask, there are those who are willing to say, what is a Goribir, what, what would a Goribir Bangladesh look like? And I think that's an important question to ask ourselves. Like, can you imagine what that would look like? Do you dare to imagine what that would look like? What kind of art could you draw out of it? What kind of poetry could come out of it? What kind of people could be shaped from it? I think if we allow, if our imagination is not stagnant, and if it's not fertile, if it's not sort of, it's not dormant, then perhaps there is hope. And I would like to say that conversations like this offer, offer a sense of like, you know, we're willing to have these conversations. Obviously, the situation is a bit shit for everyone everywhere. We are living in a time of where, where the, the governments that we, the sort of the worlds of the states that we imagine are becoming more autocratic, more oppressive, more... But, but I mean, more sort of um, repressive, right? Then they don't get better. We might imagine that the state gets better, but actually they don't. And so perhaps, 
you know, what I'm trying to do is trying to think, how do we, you know, and I think um, what I'm trying to say is that the states will get more repressive, but that in itself is not a bad thing. I mean, it is a bad thing. It's an awful thing. But that is a, not a bad thing because we shape our tools in the way, you know, we will shape, reshape our tools. We will reshape our um, sort of our ways of thinking and I, uh, sort of our ways of fighting them. What it does is that it creates a bigger and better fight, and and we and, and it will it will be fought. But as long as the state fights back, people will fight. And so I'm not I'm I mean I'm not one to suggest. I think there is I'm not one to give up and be fatalistic. But I'm not I'm I'm also not one to I mean historians don't really want to talk about futures because we generally get it wrong. Um, we I mean we we often get it wrong. But what we do want to do here is at least give the tools. You know, you think about the tools with which we can fight those fights that are going to come, and they will come. So anyway, yes. Okay, thank you, Laili. And uh, one more question from Srimoy. Srimoy, and if there is anyone who want to ask questions, please give me a SMS or raise your hand. And we are very close to the end. বক্তব্য <laughs> 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 ইন্টারেস্টিং জিনিস দেখলাম যে সেটা হচ্ছে যে একজন ডিকলোনাইজেশনের জায়গা থেকে কথা বলছেন আরেকজন একটা বামপন্থী ওয়ার্কিং ক্লাস হিস্টোরিয়ানের জায়গা থেকে ইন্টারোগেট করছে শুধু আমার মানে সেখানে মনে হলো যে একটা ধরনের পলিটিক্যাল ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ খোঁজার চেষ্টা Uh, which does not disallow moral conscience uh, 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 the place of political art articulation. Uh, interesting. Even Samiyar Bhaktobbe a decolonized post-colonialism a critic to Ashche Hato Shekhan Teke Je post-colonialism to Akta Jagate প্রাচ্য এবং পাশ্চাত্যের এই বিভেদটা কিভাবে কনস্টিটিউটেড হচ্ছে সেটাতে অনেক বেশি ইন্টারেস্টেড তার বাইরে গিয়ে কিছু মানে তার পসিবিলিটি খোঁজার জায়গাটা নেই এখন সেখানে এই প্রজেক্টটা খুবই ইন্টারেস্টিং মুশকিলটা আমার যেটা মনে হয় ডিকলোনাইজেশনে যে এটা রাইট উইং এরও একটা মানে ভারতবাসী ইনফিনিটি ফাউন্ডেশন এই গ্লোবাল ফাউন্ডেশন গুলো যেগুলো হিন্দু রাষ্ট্রের কথা বলছে তারাও কিন্তু ডিকলোনাইজেশনের কথা বলছে তারাও বলছে পলিটিক্যাল পোস্ট কলোনালিজম অ্যাকচুয়ালি আমাদের আমাদের পিছিয়ে দিয়েছে হ্যাঁ আমাদের আটকে দিয়েছে কারণ আমাদের এই ডিফারেন্স এর গল্পই আটকে দিয়েছে আমাদের এগিয়ে যেতে দেয় আমাদের সেখান থেকে আমাদের নতুন করে ইতিহাস লিখতে হবে জেমস মিলের ইতিহাস লিখতে চলবে না এই পার্টিশন চলবে না সেখানে আমরা আমাদের মতো করে সেই গোল্ডেন এজ অফ হিন্দু ওয়াটএভার সেটাকে নিয়ে আসব তা আমার সেই আমি সেখানে আর কি ডিকলোন কি হচ্ছে আমি সেখানে আর কি ডিকলোনাইজেশনের একটা ক্রিটিক যদি ভাবতে হয় যেটা যে যে ক্রিটিকটা আর কি এই কনফ্লিটেড হয়ে যাবে না কোলাপসড হয়ে যাবে না একটা আল্ট্রা ন্যাশনালিস্ট রেটের উপর কারণ হিস্টোরিয়ান ক্ষেত্রে সেই স্ট্র্যাটেজিটাও ভাবতে হয় কারণ বড়বড় বল্টা বেঞ্জামিন বসে বলেছেন যে যে রাইট উইং এর হাতে কিন্তু এই সবকটাই আছে আর কি যেটা আমরা একভাবে নিয়ে একটা সো কলড প্রোগ্রেসিভ পলিটিক্স এর মানে ওই প্রোগ্রেসিভ না অন্য ধরনের প্রোগ্রেসিভ মানে পলিটিক্স এর কথা বলছি এখন সেখানে সেই জায়গা থেকে আমার ডক্টর সামিয়াকে আমার প্রশ্ন এবং আমি ইন্টারেস্টেড জানতে যে 
যে হোয়াট অ্যাবাউট ট্রান্সলেশন আপনি তো ট্রান্সলেশনের কথা বললেন এবং ট্রান্সলেশন বলতে তো আজকাল আমরা শুধু অনুবাদ ভাবি না ট্রান্সলেশন তো একটা কনসেপচুয়াল ক্যাটাগরি তো সেখানে যদি আমি টেক্সটটাকে দেখি তাহলে কি টেক্সটটা আমাকে শুধুই সাউথ এশিয়ার পেছনে নিয়ে যাচ্ছে নাকি মানে সাউথ এশিয়া অন্য কোন সময়ের গল্প নিয়ে আসছে নাকি আমাকে হয়তো কানেক্টেড হিস্ট্রি কথা বলছে আমাকে আমার তো শুনে মনে হলো খুব মনোজেনিস্ট একটা আইডিয়া আসছে আদম পুরুষ সবাই একটা সব সব এক একই সূত্র থেকে আসছে এটা খুব মনোজেনিস্ট এক্সপ্লেনেশন যেটাকে অ্যাকচুয়ালি আমরা জানি লেট এইটিন সেঞ্চুরি আর্লি নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরিতে পলিজেনিস্টরা নিয়ে নিচ্ছে এবং নিয়ে তারা দেখাচ্ছে যে একই সূত্র নয় জেনাসটা এক নয় বিভিন্ন রেসের বিভিন্ন সূত্র এবং এটার মধ্যে দিয়ে রেসটাকে ফ্লেক্সিবল করে দিচ্ছে এবং হার্ড এন্ড করে দিচ্ছে অ্যাট দ্য সেম টাইম মানে রেসকে অ্যানালাইজ করার জায়গাটা বাড়িয়ে দিচ্ছে আবার রেস এস এ ক্যাটাগরি অনেক হার্ড এন্ড করে দিচ্ছে সে মানে সেখান থেকে আমি যদি দেখি তাহলে একটা এইটিন সিক্সটি ফাইভে হঠাৎ একটা এরকম একটা কথা বলছে যেখানে ইটস নট পলিজেনিজম ইট ইজ অ্যাবাউট গোয়িং ব্যাক টু মনোজেনিজম গোয়িং ব্যাক টু মনোজেনিজম কাইন্ড অফ রিভিজিটিং মনোজেনিজম টু একটা মনোজেনাস আইডিয়া কে নিয়ে আসা এই জায়গা থেকে দেখলে কিন্তু আমি এটাকে ট্রান্সলেশন কানেক্টেড হিস্ট্রি এখান থেকে দেখতে পারি রাদার দেন মেয়ারলি আ সাউথ এশিয়ান সাউথ এশিয়ান মোড অফ থিঙ্কিং এইটা আমার সামিয়া খাতনের কাছে আমার মানে আমার বক্তব্যটা আমি রাখলাম আই উড লাইক um so thank you so much for those um incredibly uh pertinent thoughts um i don't i want to just say that i don't think what the casa salambia is doing is monogenist um it's doing a thing where it's taking various different forms of thought various different philosophical systems many different and it's definitely not just hindu muslim there's many 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 different uh, streams of thought and it's weaving them together and showing its audience how you actually be all of them how you be both muslim and you be both you know someone who believes in brahma and so on and i guess it's it's a sufi text so it's a very it's its whole purpose is to weave together a range of different types of thought so ei jaga theke jodi dekhi ekdom thik dhorechen apni je eta shudhu bharotborsher othoba south asia er um south asia te amaderke phire ane na eta ekta methodology je bhabe ami boi ta byabohar korechi australia nama um I went and found all these different South Asian varieties of historical storytelling. And I also went and found lots of Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal oral forms of telling history. And in Australia Nama, I tried to use the method that the writers in the Casa Salambia use to weave together different philosophies of thought. তো এইখানে খুবই ইন্টারেস্টিং কারণ আপনি ট্রান্সলেশন কথাটা নিয়ে এসেছেন সবচেয়ে মজার জিনিস হচ্ছে যে আমি জানি না ট্রান্সলেশন অনুবাদ তর্জমা এই জায়গাটা কেন চিন্তা এত সফিস্টিকেটেড এই যে এই পুথি পুথির মধ্যে ট্রান্সলেশন জিনিস নিয়ে পুথি যারা লিখতো তারা যা যে জিনিসগুলো লেখে ইটস মাইন্ড ব্লো বিকজ ইন এসেন্স দ্য ওয়ে আই ওয়ার্ক আউট হাউ আই টেক প্যারাডাইম ইন দা কাস আলাম্বিয়া and turn it into a paradigm that I use in Australia Nama, the book, is through a metaphor for translation that the poet, Munshi Razawullah, uses himself, where he's describing how he translates books that are in Farsi, Arbi, Hindi, etc. into a Bangla book. So in his metaphor for translation, he very much tells us how you can actually do this method anywhere you can do it using aboriginal history you can do it using european history you can do it anywhere in the world so it's very much a global uh, it, it's a tool that can travel very 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 well so um i think you know i i that's all i'll say in terms of um your thoughts about monogism and translation lead me to say actually this is a paradigm of translation that allows us to sidestep monogism and poly 
Jenna's thoughts. Um, it, it actually gives us a way of doing something quite apart from that entire paradigm, I would say. So, yeah, uh, thank you for your thoughts, though. Okay, Amra Agdum Shishpurji Shagati, Amra Jotishu Kotavatra Bullet Shatke. আর আর কেউ কি কথা বলবেন কেউ কিছু জানতে আমি কারোর হাত তোলা দেখছি না এনিওয়ান আমার মনে হয় যে শেজাদ কিছু একবার দুইবার হাত তুললে শেজাদ হাতটা আবার নামিয়ে নিল কেন জানি শেজাদ সবার প্রশ্নের কারণে আমার উত্তর পাওয়া হয়ে গেছে আচ্ছা আচ্ছা তৌফিক খান হাত উঠেছে তৌফিক খান তৌফিক ভাই আপনি যদি কিছু বলেন আমার মনে হয় যে আমি মুখ ধরে শুনছিলাম আমি দুজন আমি দুঃখিত যে আমার প্রফেশনাল কারণে ঢুকতে আমার দেরি হয়েছে আমি পুরোটা শুনতে পারিনি আমি একটা মিস করেছি আলোচনা থেকে কিছুটা গেস করেছি প্রশ্ন যারা শুধু আলোচক না যারা প্রশ্ন করলেন অসম্ভব ধন্যবাদ দিতে চাই সবাইকে এবং এবং আই থিঙ্ক এই ব্যাপারগুলি সব জায়গা কাছে পরিষ্কার হয়েছে এটা আমি কনফিউজ করবো যে না সব পরিষ্কার হয়নি এই ধরনের ডিসকাশন গুলি আনমিউট করতে হবে আমি শুনে আনন্দ পাইলাম তবুও আমি বামিংহামে আসি অনেকদিন যাবৎ আসি একটা কথা বলতে হয় যে আমার খুব ভালো লাগলো যে দুইটা দুইজনই বলতে অসুবিধা নাই আমার বয়সের অনুযায়ী দুইটা ইয়ং মেয়ে বাংলাদেশের মেয়ে এরা সোয়াসে আছে বাংলাদেশের ইতিহাস এবং ইতিহাস নিয়ে পড়াশোনা করছে কারণ আমার মতো যারা অনেকদিন যাবৎ ইংল্যান্ডে আছেন তারা জানেন যে ইমিগ্রেন্ট বাঙালিদের অবস্থা কি কেমন অবস্থায় পারিবারিক সীমাবদ্ধতা পার হয়ে ইউনিভার্সিটিতে গেছে এবং জ্ঞানের চর্চা করতেছে কারণ আমাদের এখানে তো আমরা গরিব মানুষ সব আমাদের সবাই ছেলে মেয়েদের পড়াইতে দিলেই ডাক্তার বানাই আর উকিল বানাই খারাপ কিছু না তবু আমাদের ইতিহাস সাহিত্য রাজনীতি এ সমস্ত অনেক কিছুর সঙ্গেই আমাদের জ্ঞান থাকা উচিত আপনারা আমার <laughs> <laughs> um you will i no doubt you will enlighten uh, our community you will carry our community with you so i hope in, in no time in future we don't have to say 
that we are the poorest, we are the most deprived and discriminated against community. That is what we are used to saying. Uh, um, one thing I will, I will say uh, through both of your discussion, I listen very carefully. Um, I think uh, Samia said something that the, the partition has started with the historical discourse. We have to find the historical discourse to overcome it. Um, uh, something along that line, you have said. Uh, it's quite early in the discussion, and I, I, I can't remember the exact word you said. Um, what I would say that uh, partition is not a historical. Uh, it did not come about a, as a historical event. It's, it's a political event. It's a political power game. Um, is involved in it. So if we try to find uh, the reason of partition and overcome those reasons, we are not, if we confine ourselves to history, we're not going to get all the answers. We are, because somebody did already raise this question of the relationship between partition and capital. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is a very pertinent question because um, colonialism started with the formation of East India Company. It was a trading company. It was not a political entity. Uh, they wanted to make profit. At the time, in 1750, um, colonialism was the money earner for the capitalism. In 1947, partition is the money earner. Because now, both India and Pakistan compete against each other, how many atomic bombs they can make. And where do they buy their spare parts from? Where do they know how it comes from? They're all sold. India and Pakistan go on war. And all the weapons of war, weapons of mass destruction, they all come from West. So the partition had become big business. Partition it makes profit for capital. So there is a relationship um, between capital and partition as it was uh, 200 years ago. There's a relationship between capitalism and uh, colonialism. Uh, I, I like your idea of being a working class historian. I, I, I classified it earlier in the when the question was posed, uh, asked by Samina, that uh, who is progressive, I actually put that I'm a communist. communist. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, I do like to see that, that I'm working class historians. I'm in Birmingham. Um, we used to have quite a few working class mm -hmm. institutions in Birmingham. Unfortunately, yeah. for lack of funding and for various other reasons, uh, they are not uh, as functioning as, as they used to be. I still go to Manchester, the, the Trade Union History Museum in Manchester. Um, there's not much in London in terms of trade union and working class history, but I hope, I know, SWAS is a progressive institution, both of you are there. Um, maybe it is our time <laughs> that we can. Uh, but being an elderly Bengali, you remember, mm -hmm. you might have heard this saying, uh, uh, Gokhel, uh, say the, what Bengal thinks today, the rest of India thinks it tomorrow. <laughs> maybe two of you, you can start some, some thinking the rest of uh, Europe can. Be proud of you. I'm certainly proud good. of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Idris Bhai. Amader Idris Bhai chila amader murubi. Ebang amad dharna the amra jhoto stralap kurti. Ebang eita cholte thakbe amader yalla pashole shesh hobe na. Deshbhag neu amader yalla amader ashole shesh hoyni. Amra ashole chiste kuchhi 
খুব ছোট পরিসরের হলেও কিছু মানুষজনকে একসাথে করার যেখানে আমরা নিজেদের চিন্তা ভাবনাগুলোকে একে অপরের সঙ্গে একটু সানিয়ে নিতে পারবো ঝালিয়ে নিতে পারবো শেয়ার করতে পারবো তার জন্যই অস্ত্র আর্কাইভের তরফ থেকে এই উদ্যোগ এবং আপনারা যারা যুক্ত হয়েছেন সে তার জন্য আপনাদের সবাইকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ বিশেষ করে সামিয়া এবং লাইলি যারা আজকে অনেক সময় নিয়ে তাদের প্রেজেন্টেশন দিয়েছেন এবং অনেকগুলো প্রশ্নের উত্তর দিলেন আমাদের ধারণা ভবিষ্যতে আবারও আমাদের সময় সুযোগ হলে আমাদের আবারও কথা হবে এবং আপনাদের সবারকে জানানোর জন্য এটুকু বলছি যে আমাদের দেশভাগ নিয়ে সম্ভবত শেষ প্রোগ্রামটা হবে পরের সপ্তাহে তৌফিক খান যিনি আজকে একটি শেষ পর্যায়ে এসে কথা বলেছেন উনি বঙ্গভঙ্গ এবং দেশভাগ এবং তার প্রেক্ষাপট নিয়ে তার সুদূর প্রসারী ফলাফল নিয়ে একটি প্রেজেন্টেশন দেবেন আমাদের পরবর্তী আলাপ এরপর আমরা এর ভাবে এর মধ্যে দিয়ে আমরা আশা করছি দেশভাগ বিষয়ক এবারের আলোচনাটা আমরা শেষ করব এবার এরপর থেকে আমাদের শুরু হয়ে যাবে লোক সংস্কৃতি বিষয়ক একটি দীর্ঘ আলোচনা আপনাদের সবার জন্য আমি আরেকটি কথা জানিয়ে রাখি কারণ শেষ হয়ে যাচ্ছে প্রোগ্রাম তার আগে যেটুকু বলতে চাই আমাদের আর্কাইভ থেকে আমরা একটি উদ্যোগ নিয়েছি সেই উদ্যোগটা হচ্ছে চিঠি এবং আলোকচিত্র সংগ্রহ প্রকল্প এই দুটো জিনিস খুব দ্রুত হারিয়ে যাচ্ছে চিঠি এবং আলোকচিত্র আমরা সংগ্রহ করার একটি চেষ্টা করছি অলরেডি কিছু সংগ্রহ করেছি সেই সূত্র ধরেই আমরা কিছু পুরনো ফটোগ্রাফস পেয়েছি পুরনো ফটো চিঠি পেয়েছে তার মধ্যে মৌলানা ভাষানী সিগনেচার করে একটি চিঠি আছে সিক্সটি নাইন এর কৃষক সমিতির চিঠি তো এরকম ভাবে আমরা চেষ্টা করছি আপনাদের তরফ থেকে যদি কখনো কোন রকম সহযোগিতা করার কোন সুযোগ থাকে আপনারা যদি মনে করেন যে কিছু আপনারা কন্ট্রিবিউট করতে চান আমাদের আর্কাইভে আপনার যে কেউ আপনাদেরকে বলা থাকলো আমাদের সবাইকে আমন্ত্রণ যে সবাইকে কারণ সবার সহযোগিতা এটা করে উঠছে অনেকদিন পর সামিয়া যে কোন একটা অস্ট্রেলিয়া ডেজার্ট থেকে আবিষ্কার করবে এর জন্য অপেক্ষা না করে আমরা এখন একটা আর্কাইভ করার চেষ্টা করছি যেখানে আমরা এগুলো ফিল করতে পারি এবং আমরা চেষ্টা করছি আপনাদের কাছ থেকে যদি কিছু থাকে বা আপনাদের যদি মনে হয় যে কোনো কানেকশন কোনো সাহায্য করতে পারে আপনাদের আমাদের সাথে যোগাযোগ করে দিবেন আমার মনে হয় যে সবাইকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ বিশেষ করে সামিয়া এবং লাইদিকে এবং ইদিস ভাই সবাইকে এবং আরো যারা ছিলেন এখন আমাদের সঙ্গে আবার আমাদের দেখা হবে দেশ ভাগ বিষয়ক আরেকটি আলোচনায় আপনাদের সবাইকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আজকের মতো Thank you for having us.